Hey everybody, today we are debating whether or not the Romans should have disproven the resurrection and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are thrilled to have you here for another epic debate as tonight we have two special guests and you could say that we are in the middle of their journey as we'll describe in just a bit but want to let you know if it's your first time here consider hitting that subscribe button as we are very excited to have you here and for many more debates to come we want to let you know we're a nonpartisan channel so no matter what walk of life you come from we really do hope you feel welcome and we as a channel being nonpartisan never make any sort of statements it's really up to the debaters and then it's up for you as the audience to explain who you found most persuasive and with that we're going to get started this is going to be a lot of fun folks and the reason is this is a really special debate this is something we've never gotten to do before but with this debate came an opportunity where basically dr richard carrier and jonathan were already doing their debate and this was in the written form which i've linked in the description and i'm going to give dr carrier a chance to explain that and about that in just a bit but it's based Basically, you could say that we're kind of in the sequel. And so if you want to get to enjoy the prequel and get to kind of delve deeper into these issues, which I highly suggest, you're able to do that by clicking on that link in the description, which is just under the speakers links. And so if this is your first time hearing the speakers, well, great news. I put their links as well in the description box. So that way you can hear plenty more from them. And with that, want to let you know that today's format, given that this is kind of the sequel in a way, will be different and kind of a new variety. I like the kind of spicing it up is what we'll have is basically introductions in just a moment where I will ask the speakers if they'd be willing to share with us. We'd love to get to hear what they've been doing at their blog or website or YouTube channel. And then we'll give after those introductions a chance where Dr. Richard Carrier will basically explain the, you could say the prequel story behind this debate, and then we will do their closing statements. So that'll be five minutes at the very start. And like I said, this is the sequel. And so following those five minute closings, we'll have 50 minutes of open dialogue, which I think people really love the open dialogue, and then question and answer, which will also be 50 minutes. So if you have a question, feel free to fire it into the old live chat. If you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, makes it easier for me to get every single question in that Q&A list. Super Chat is also an option, in which case you could make a comment toward one or both of the speakers. Of course, they would get a chance to respond to that comment. And we ask that you be your regular friendly selves for whether it be a question or comment. And with that, when I kick it over, we will start going from left to right with Dr. Richard Carrier. It's a pleasure to have you on, Dr. Richard Carrier. I have, like I told him just before we went live, I said, I've been listening to Dr. Carrier's debates for a good number of years. And so we are very excited to have you, Dr. Carrier. If you'd like to share what you've been up to at your website, we are all ears. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, my web, uh, which is richardcarrier.info, uh, I you can find out all things about me, my you know curriculum vitae, my biography, and but also I write articles uh, in both philosophy and ancient history, religion and other topics, ancient science included, um, various other odd things, uh, and you can get all my books. I have multiple books. Uh, you can check those out there also uh, at my site. And I'm also teaching courses every month. I'm doing an online course on various subjects in philosophy and history, uh, and I'm offering multiple courses every month. So I just put up, I think, a blog post for the, the one I just added for the roster in July, which is ancient atheism. So if you want to like study who were ancient atheists, what kind of arguments did they use, how did people think about atheism in the ancient world, ancient Greek, Greek and Roman world, uh, join that course and, and come in and learn stuff about that. But I also teach uh, science and philosophy of free will, uh, and uh, counter apologetics and debate and numerous other topics. So people who are interested in taking a course from me, uh, from you know, PhD in ancient history, intellectual history, uh, who's published on a lot of these subjects, uh, you're welcome to come join. And so that, those are the things that I'm basically doing on my blog, articles, books, and, uh, and classes. 
Absolutely. Well, that's excellent. And like I had said, folks, both of the speakers are linked in the description where you can hear or read plenty more. And with that, we'll kick it over to Jonathan. Thrilled to have you back, Jonathan. Glad to see you. And what have you been up to? Um, well, uh, <laughs> thanks for having me back. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, actually getting to sit down with Dr. Carrier this evening. Uh, as for myself, um, you know, over the last three, three and a half years, I've kind of uh, formed my own apologetic channel, uh, actually putting uh, apologetics to 2D and 3D animations, uh, depending the reliability of the New Testament uh, and engaging on historical uh, topics uh, from the Anglican perspective. You bet. With that, we are very excited. Thanks for sharing that, Jonathan. We will go into this portion where Dr. Richard Carrier will give kind of some of the background in terms of how this is the sequel that we're getting to kind of continue this journey on with them. And so thanks, Dr. Carrier, if you want to fill in the crowd, just catching them up. Yeah, um, well, Jonathan and I have done this before. Well, we didn't do the video part, but um, so Jonathan organizes these debates, uh, comes up with these interesting concepts that are side ideas that they're like um, important, but they're issues that usually don't get debated directly. So like previously, we debated specifically on the long ending of Mark, the authenticity of that. Uh, and we did a long written debate uh, exchange of uh, entries on that. And then um, uh, he had the idea of doing this specific debate, which is to debate whether uh, the Roman Empire, the Romans, Pontius Pilate, etc should have and would have investigated the truth of the resurrection and should have and would have refuted it unless it had been true. And that's the position uh, that Jonathan takes. And then as an ancient historian and a, a unbeliever, uh, I'm taking the contrary to that. And so we did uh, just basically two, two posts each on this. Like he did an opening statement uh, on my blog. Uh, I did a written response. He did a response to that. And then I did a final response to that. So it's just four articles. Um, of roughly 2,000 words each. Uh, and then um, we decided we would wrap it up uh, with Jonathan's idea to do it in live format like this so we can get to Q&A and just talk it out and so on. And so I think it's a neat idea. And so I'm like kind of looking forward to how it works out. Absolutely. Well, we are honored to be a part of it. And so with that, we will go into these closing statements. As I had mentioned, this will be five minutes from each speaker and I'm trying to remember who will go first, if you guys can help me out with that. So sorry about that. It makes sense for Jonathan to go first. Okay. You bet. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Carrier. So why weren't the rulers of the Roman Empire able to falsify the resurrection of Jesus? With Caesar on the throne, Rome ruled the modern world and stationed a representative of its power in the capital of every province as a reminder of the empire's authority. It was the duty of these ruling officials to administer Roman law and execute the will of Caesar. Jesus stood before a court of this governing strength charged with high treason because he had claimed to be a king. The arrest of Jesus by order from the Lieutenant of Caesar, instigated by the suggestions of the president and members of the Jewish Sanhedrin, had much more magnitude than just a simple common offense charge. It's important to understand the context of Jesus's public perception. He was characterized as a teacher and was a highly influential leader of multitudes in Galilee, as well as citizens in other districts. Jesus unbashedly brought conflict to the political and religious landscape throughout the area. He appeared in the capital city of Judea and hurled denunciations against the constituted authorities of the whole Jewish polity. Jesus claimed to be the only proper authority over the conduct of human relations in every sphere of life, an authority greater of that than a political leader. He chose a band of men and trained them under these ideas while envisioning a new kingdom for his followers. All this had gone on for three years in the face of an opposition that warned admonish, rebuked, and threaten him from the highest sources of his government. Eusebius Histories reports that in the aftermath of Jesus's death, the account of Jesus's resurrection was becoming famous throughout the empire and was the subject of general discussion all over Palestine. This is consistent with Tacitus's writings of Christianity, which he associated with the destructive superstition that had originated and spread throughout Judea 
and had fallen on Rome. This undoubtedly places the account of Jesus' resurrection on the empire's radar. The circumstances of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were too well known and controversial to be ignored by the government, whether ecclesiastical or political. This explains why those seated at the court of the emperor, like Festus, Felix, Agrippa, and others, opened up an investigation following the same procedural precedent modeled from Rome's investigation of the Bacchus cult in its interrogation of Paul. It's of great interest here to note that after the final overthrow of Jerusalem, when the ruins were held by a garrison of Roman soldiers, Vespasian commanded a strict search to be made of all who claimed descent from the house of David in an effort to cut off all hopes of restoring the royal house of the Messiah. This shows what the great Roman emperor Vespasian thought of a Jewish king and the possibility of a hope of one in the Jewish mind 40 years after the rule of Pilate and Tiberius. Emperor Maximum II went on to publish forged memoranda of Pilate and Jesus in 311 AD throughout the empire. This action is a manifestation of that same goal to achieve a similar end for Christianity, which demonstrates the ramifications of Jesus's resurrection and the impact it had on Roman society. Yet no credible counter narrative to Jesus and the resurrection, despite the empire's able rulers, conversant historians, and executive control of the surrounding area. The empire was surely familiar with the works of Herodotus and Plutarch, which establishes knowledge in the ancient world of how similar supernatural claims, like that of Aristius and Romulus, could be easily explained away in a naturalistic way. If the resurrection were only a hoax, it seems very strange that there is not a single credible record or tome from the ancient world providing a naturalistic explanation for the expense events that transpired in Judea. The probable reason why the results of the investigation were not recorded, unless Justin and Tertullian's report is correct, is because the outcome would not be pleasing to the emperor, which would not be favorable to the well-being of his subordinates. With that, I turn over the time to Dr. Carrier. You bet. Thank you, Jonathan. All set for you, Dr. Carrier. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's this argument. And for people who want to go into further detail, uh, both Jonathan and I have written up a lot more about this. So, like, we're going to get, we're going to just summarizing it here, but there's a lot of like scholarly citations and details and other things uh, in our write up. So, people who want to really dive into this can go there. Um, for myself, there's, I'll just quickly summarize what my response was, which um, was essentially that the Romans actually didn't care about beliefs. Uh, the first thing that we need to make a distinction of is this idea of policing beliefs was a later Christian idea. Once, once Christianity took over the empire, they're the ones who connected belief with behavior and tried to control behavior by controlling belief. The Romans never made that connection. They, they didn't care what you believed. Uh, they were, at this point in history in the Roman Empire, they were highly tolerant of all beliefs. They didn't really care what you believed as long as you behaved correctly. So they were more interested in behavior, and that mostly meant just obeying the law and paying homage to Caesar, to, Caesar, to the proper authorities. And um, so consequently, the, the going around claiming that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, they didn't care about that. Uh, and we see that, in fact, uh, Sheffield's own Bible confirms this. The book of Acts shows no one ever actually investigated this claim, uh, least of all Pilate. Like he did, he's a no-show in the entire book of Acts. Um, numerous court hearings are depicted in the book of Acts, however, and both Jewish and Roman, and always they, these hearings, the way they're depicted, they reveal that the only claims being made were about interpretations of scripture and reports of visions, and that's it. Those are the only claims, and all these hearings rule that, well, there's nothing we can do about that. Like the Romans said, we're not interested in this. That's a religious squabble between you guys. I, I don't see any legal issue here for us to deal with. And the Jewish court kind of had the similar idea. The Sanhedrin said, well, I don't know, maybe an angel or a spirit spoke to this guy. We really can't find anything wrong with that. And so there's no further investigation done. The Book of Acts consistently shows this. They just weren't interested in this claim. Uh, they, they were more interested in behavior uh, than anything else. And that's what they were trying to control. They didn't connect the two uh, for that. 
Um, we've got multiple examples of that, by the way. So uh, already, you know, like I think that the argument's kind of dead in the water from that point on. But even later examples confirm this. Uh, Jonathan mentioned um, Domitian, for example. Domitian does not investigate the resurrection claim. He's worried that maybe somebody's claiming to be a king of the Jews, finds out that they're not, they're just a bunch of rabble with weird ideas, and he just dismisses them. He's, he doesn't even do anything about it. Uh, so he doesn't, he doesn't investigate it, he doesn't even ask about the resurrection claim. He's not interested in it. Uh, when we get to Pliny the Younger, he'd never even heard of it. Uh, finally, he interrogated uh, two deaconesses to try and figure out what it was they believed. And as soon as he heard the silly things they were saying, he stopped his investigation immediately, said, this is just a ridiculous superstition. I don't even see why I'm continuing with this. His only interest was, are you paying homage to the emperor? Are you assembling without a license from the state? And those are the only things he cared about. And it was behavior, not belief. So he wasn't really concerned about that. When we get to Justin Martyr, we have the account of Rusticus who prosecuted Justin Martyr. The issue of the resurrection never comes up in that uh, dispute. It's only the legal assembly and homage to the emperor. Those the behavior is the only thing. Uh, Justin himself doesn't bring up the resurrection, doesn't bring up any evidence for the resurrection, uh, doesn't cite any documents pertaining to the resurrection, Rusticus doesn't ask about it, it just doesn't come up, like it, it wasn't a relevant issue legally for the Romans, they just weren't concerned about it. Um, there's also of course no evidence that any records from Pilate's tenure even survived into the second century, uh, for a variety of reasons those records appear to have just been uh, burned, lost, basically uh, aged out, because uh, it's a hundred years, uh, so even if Pilate had done anything, it's clear no one knew what he did. Uh, the only thing we get is uh, references to the so-called Acts of Pilate, which we actually have extant excerpts from, uh, which are clearly a Christian forgery. They're, they're not, they don't even look like official Roman documents. They're just a fawning repetition of the miracle stories in the Gospels. Um, so we, we can't authenticate any uh, Acts of Pilate. We can't authenticate the contents of them. We can't authenticate that there was any reference to this claim uh, in them at all. And so we don't, no one knew anything about it by the time you get to the second century. So there really isn't anything to sustain this. Now, when we get into the third century, the Romans start getting more concerned because Christianity had grown to a large enough length that it was large enough size and large enough adherence that they were seeing it as a political problem uh, more than they did previously. And that's when they start getting more and more involved in trying to uh, suppress Christian doctrine and so forth. But before that, they, they didn't see an issue with it. Uh, they were only concerned about behavior, whether you paid homage to Caesar, whether you were assembling without a license from the state. And that, that was just it. Uh, so, I mean, ultimately what they said in the end is, if it's just visions and interpretations of scripture, I don't know what to do with that. Like there's nothing, we can, there's no further investigation to be done. Um, and so they left it at that. And that's kind of what it was. And in a sense, you know, Jonathan says they didn't leave a record of any naturalistic explanation. In fact, they did. Uh, it's in the book of Acts. It's like, well, he just had visions and he, maybe he's crazy and just had, you know, maybe he hallucinated or dreamed these things. Um, and uh, he's got like, you know, crazy tinfoil hat readings of scripture or something like that. That's their naturalistic interpretation of it. And there wasn't anything further they could do about it. There wasn't any way to prove or refute uh, those statements because they're all subjective in the head of the person involved and Paul in the case usually. Uh, so that's my position on this and I go into more detail with citations and so on uh, and examples and evidence in the written portion of the debate. You bet. Thanks so much. And with that, as mentioned, that written portion of the debate link, debate link is down in the description box waiting for you folks so you can check that out. And with that, we will jump into the open conversation. So gentlemen, thanks so much and the floor is all yours. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I, I guess one of the first things, uh, Dr. Caria, um, in, in your latest uh, rebuttal uh, to my response, you had mentioned that there was no evidence that any real acts of pilot uh, have ever been mentioned or would have been mentioned. Now, uh, if you just allow me a, a moment or two. I mean, uh, during the first uh, Roman empires, I mean, there were acts of the Senate, acts of the city, uh, the people of Rome and other cities and acts of governors of provinces. Um, Suetonius tells us, you know, that Julius Caesar, you know, very first enactment after becoming consul was that the proceedings, both of the Senate and the people should day by day be compiled published. 
Uh, Philo speaks of the acts or memoirs of Alexandria sent to Caliglia that uh, the emperor read. Um, and, and then we have these reports from Justin and Tertullian. Uh, and, and what's interesting about Justin's uh, petition is he's addressing the Emperor Antonius, his sons, the Roman Senate, and he's actually quoting the prophecies, laying out the facts concerning Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. And in just one apology, he refers three times to the acts which were recorded under Pontius Pilate as indisputable evidence of his assertion that Jesus had fulfilled these prophecies. And, and we, we see the similar type of language in Tertullian's written apology, that he advocates for the divinity of Jesus on account of his life, his death, and his resurrection. And he points to the Roman records for confirmation of these facts in the second book of his apologetics. And he says that he tells the magistrates that all was this was reported uh, to Tiberius at that particular time. Yeah, I mean, that's what they believed and claimed, but there's no evidence that they actually had access to any such records. There's no evidence that those rec the real ones ever survived. When we get these references in like Tertullian, for example, we can tell he's referring to a Christian forgery, not the actual court documents or the actual acta of, of the provinces. Because for example, uh, Tertullian specifically says that the acts of Pilate that he's talking about refers to the scene where the soldiers divide the garments of Jesus, which is actually a lift from the Psalms and appears in the gospels. Um, but true or false, that's a detail that would never be in a report uh, on this subject. It just wouldn't be relevant. It's only relevant to Christians who have a particular sacred history. And so what we have is a reference to an Acts of Pilate that is defending Christian sacred history as written out in the Gospels. That's a Christian document. Uh, and we have an example of it. We actually have a surviving, in the Gospel of Nicodemus, we have a surviving excerpt from what was this Acts of Pilate that uh, Tertullian and Justin are referring to. And it's clearly a fawning Christian uh, invention. It's it's clearly not anything that looks like official correspondence from uh, the Romans. It doesn't act like it, doesn't look like it. It looks like just some Christian made up a document claiming to be by Pilate that basically had vindicated everything in the Gospels is all true and so on. Uh, but there's no way to verify that that's actually real, that that wasn't just made up. And so I don't, I don't see any way to verify that any real acts of Pilate had survived into the second century. I mean, it was a hundred years um, Rome's archives had burned multiple times uh, in, in the intervening period. Um, very little would get sent from the provinces anyway. Um, like if you had the acts, for example, the acts of the prefects of the provinces, it would have a line item saying that Jesus was executed for treason, but it wouldn't have any details. Like that's it. That's the acts were just like, this is the stuff that happened. It's not detailed reports. The only time you get detailed reports is when there's a major uh, sedition that they have to deal with, like uh, a rebellion or something, and actually military action had to be taken, uh, riots had to be suppressed or something like that. Then you would get some sort of record, but even that might not get sent to Rome uh, if it was easily dealt with. Pilate was doing this all the time. He couldn't flood the emperor with, you know, documents about things that he's already taken care of. But we don't have any evidence of any of this either. Like it might have existed, like there might have been records of Pilate dealing with Christians in some fashion, um, Acts doesn't seem to know of any. He never mentions Pilate being involved at all. Uh, the only record Acts refers to is a letter from Claudius Lysias that doesn't mention any of these things uh, at all. It's just talking about there's some people trying to kill Paul. They had some sort of weird religious dispute. I don't know what the deal is. Uh, and he, he hands it on to the next uh, side. And in fact, he hands it up to the next level or the, the um, prefect was actually completely willing to just let Paul go. And he even says like, I don't see any issue here. I'm gonna let you go, except you, Paul, appealed to Caesar. So now I'm like formally required to send you to Rome simply because you filed the petition to do so. But otherwise he's gonna let him go. Like there wasn't, there wasn't any further investigation of that. So um, even if we believe Acts is, has any sense reacting to this, it doesn't seem to have known of any kind of Roman investigation of this stuff either. But one way or another, we don't have any record in the second century confirming that any of this stuff survived, uh, the Roman records from Pontius Pilate's tenure, uh, that anyone could consult them, that the Christians writing about them even knew, actually had ever seen them, and so on. So this, this is a pile of conjectures on top of each other can't get us to a probable conclusion. It's, it's conjectures in, conjectures out. So um, that's the problem I have with, uh, with that approach to uh, 
trying to reconstruct history that way. Now, Tacitus in his writings, uh, he does report that, you know, he was privy to records. Uh, he tells us in his annuals that I find in the records of the Senate that Antius Cyrillus could designate uh, or consul a designate gave as his opinion that a temple should be built in to Nero Divine as early as possible out of the public funds. And elsewhere, I uh, failed to discover either in the historians or in the government journals, and uh, I believe he's referring to the act, that the prince's mother, Antonia, bore any striking part in the ceremonies. Although in addition to Agripparina and Drusus and Claudius, his other blood relations are recorded by name. And, and, and we see this in Suetonius as well. Uh, they're writing into the second century and they're referring to ancient documents. Uh, what's interesting about Suetonius is he does offer evidence of consulting acts of this kind that he had recourse for in writing his histories. Uh, and Suetonius also establishes such acts and registers were available outside of Rome, particularly at Antium. For this is where Suetonius learned the day and the place of the birth of Caligula, about which there were other uncertain reports that he puts on. And he speaks of those acts of public authorities that he particularly references when he says, I myself find in the Gazette that he first saw a light at Antium. And, and he's and he speaks. Oh, go ahead. What, what, you're, what you're talking about is called the Acta Senatus. Uh, so it's it's the acts of the Senate that just basically just declared the rulings of the Senate and the actual official things that they did, like the census, for example. So you would find a record of births in the Acta Senatus. Now, the Acta Senatus was was like a, uh, how do you describe it? it? It was like an encyclopedia. It was published. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a government document that sits in archives. It was actually like a set of encyclopedias that would be published and you would be find it in every library in the empire. But it would only include these like line item things that would only be at the senatorial level, like what consuls are doing, what, uh, how money is being spent, where, uh, uh, um, for example, uh, where people were born and, and who, who's who and who's connected to who, uh, who's executed and for what, like that'll be in the Acta Senatus. But it doesn't have these detailed records of investigations and things like that. It didn't have that kind of information. And you find that they never reference it for that kind of information. It's only for the sort of ba bare bones line item stuff. It's more like a uh, uh, almanac uh, more than anything. Um, and because it was published, it was actually released and it was be available in all libraries, uh, you'd never lose it because you'd always, the copies could always be restored. So for example, when Domitian uh, presided over the burning of the archives in Rome and the libraries were lost there, uh, he sent scribes to Alexandria, to the library of Alexandria to basically replace all the books to copy their books and bring them back and restock the library of Rome. So that's where they probably the Acta Senatus that Suetonius himself was reading probably came was a copy from the one from the Library of Alexandria, for example. Um, but it would it would not contain these minutia like these little investigations and things like that. It would just be line item stuff. If anything, it might not even include the execution, uh, you know, extraordinary the execution of non citizens would probably wouldn't even be mentioned. Uh, and Jesus wasn't a citizen. So like you would probably only have execution lines or the dispositions of citizens. And mind you, there's millions and millions of people. So there's no way the Acta Senatus included uh, death records for the entire population. So uh, at most you would have incidental details dealing with citizens. But again, we don't have any evidence that the acts, uh, that the Acta Senatus contain the kinds of things that you're talking about, much less specifically the thing you're talking about. But no one, no one knows of this. We don't have any uh, reliable reference to this being the case. Um, Romans never reference it. Pliny has never heard of it when he's doing an investigation. Uh, he has to ask deaconesses what they believed. He never had no idea what they believed. He even had to ask Trajan right all the way to Rome and say, I don't know what these people believe. Help, help me out here. Uh, so it's not as if he could go check the Actus Senatus and confirm what Christians were. Clearly it wasn't in there. Uh, he didn't have any sources to tell him. So he had to ask Christians what they believed. So um, this tells us one way or another, this kind of information just wasn't available in state records, certainly by Pliny's time, if ever. Now, it's, now if, if we uh, look at Pilate, um, it, it's interesting that the renowned historian uh, George Rawlinson, uh, who's done publications on the translation of the history of Herodotus and the uh, the great five monarchies, 
says it seems certain that Pilate remitted to Tiberius an account of the execution of our Lord and the grounds of it to which Justin Martyr more than once alludes and which was deposited in the archives of the empire. Uh, well, you know, you know, one of the things that I was kind of interested in hearing your thoughts on is the relationship of Pilate and the Jewish uh, community when he had come into uh, the area, because uh, he came in and there was a tenuous relationship that Philo tells us about uh, Pilate's command coming over uh, and assuming command of the area, um, which uh, Philo reports caused Pilate great concern uh, there was a fear that Philo reports that uh, an embassy of Jews were going to report back to uh, Tiberius and send an embassy and particular report on uh, and, and bring charges against his administration, which when we look at the gospel accounts of presenting Pilate as a sort of uh, looking to set Jesus at liberty, sending him back to Herod. Seems like he wasn't invested in buying in on the charges. And due to the nature of the relationship that the Jews had under uh, Tiberius' administration, would it make sense that Pilate, given his past tenuous history with the Jews, would report to Pilate this type of activity that had occurred? This is a really good example proving my point. So here you have a big concern that gets raised. So Philo himself was the ambassador who actually went to Caligula to report this stuff. Um, and Tacitus records that Pilate actually got convicted. Uh, so he actually, ended, I think, committed suicide or something because um, he was going down for this. Um, but notice that's precisely what we don't have any evidence of for Christianity. There, there, even the book of Acts never mentions any such dispute any such issue when we get the the hearing with Festus and Felix and or the hearings multiple um there's no dispute about Pilate mishandling this case like that's just not the issue when Pilate went to when Philo went to Caligula he had a litany of legit complaints that were major uh, public issues uh, violence against the Jews and so on Christianity wasn't on the list uh right so like that's not even on the list of complaints they had it had nothing to do with uh Philo I mean Pilate didn't have to defend himself on the Christianity issue. He had to defend himself on all this other stuff, uh, which Josephus records. Like Josephus records a lot of this stuff that got him busted, basically, um, disregarding the treaty with the Jews primarily and causing unrest. Uh, so that was that was the stuff that was going on. But that's precisely the kind of thing we don't have for Christianity in the tenure of Pilate. Moreover, we're talking about embassies. People had to go to Caligula to present these things. They weren't in any kind of reports that Pilate was sending back. Uh, they had to go there and talk about it in person. Pilate eventually had to go himself and defend himself in person. So uh, this this is exactly the kind of thing that did happen in the ancient world, and it's precisely the kind of thing we have no evidence happening with respect to Christianity uh, and the disposition relating to Pilate. Well, I do have one question. You mentioned Rawlinson? Rawlinson? Yes, um, it what's, is. What's the date of that? It sounds uh, like 19th he, century, but I, yes, what, uh, he, he he is an Anglican, so uh, my uh -huh. bias uh, does come out again. That's George uh, Robinson. But what's the date of the publication? When did he flourish? Uh, eight, 18, I believe it's the check. I just, 19th uh, century in any case, though, right? Yes, it is 19th century. Yeah, century. that's so there's a lot of this bad history from the 19th century. Um, so uh, I, I wrote an article that you can find online on my old blog. Uh, it's also in my book, Hitler, Homer, Bible of Christ, but it's history before 1950, like why we can't trust history before 1950. Now, there's some history we can trust before 1950, but a lot of it, the methodology was just terrible, and 19th century was the worst. Uh, so you have to like look at more modern historians. What is what Using more modern methods, more reliable methods, what is their conclusion? And that's why I cited F.F. F. Bruce uh, in our debate. Um, where he points out that pretty much all historians today agree that the acts of the pilot that Justin and Tertullian are talking about are forgeries. There's no such document, uh, at least none that was known to the Romans that actually was in the Roman archives. And certainly there's no evidence to establish that there was. And so that, that's the modern consensus view of historians on this. Um, Rawlinson, you're, you're citing a 19th century, basically Anglican apologist historian. 
um, who's been completely overturned by modern historians using modern methods. Um, so uh, so that, that's, I, I have an issue when, when people do that. I, I run into like even Jesus mythicists who do the same thing and, and try to build their case on 19th century historians. And, and I take them to task for that because it's, it's, these are terrible historians that are making a lot of mistakes. Um, and so I, I don't give them uh, the rope on that either, and I, nor, nor can I on this side as well. So um, no, I don't think we can cite Rawlinson as an authority anymore on this. He's citing an opinion that isn't based on sound methodology. Whereas Bruce's opinion actually is based on sound uh, methodology. You can, you can go look at the actual things, the things that Tertullian and Justin say, and it's clear they're referring to some sort of fawning Christian uh, endorsement of the gospels. Uh, it's something that was written after the gospels um, and in the name of Pilate, it's, it's one of many forgeries. Christians actually engage in forgery quite a lot. Uh, we have tons and tons of examples. Uh, so, um, so we can't rely on that. We would need uh, better evidence of someone having access to a real document. Uh, and we just don't. So that, that's unfortunately, there's no, nothing further we can do uh, historically with that. Well, I I want to talk about the, the change in administration that we see from Tiberius, who had this uh, kind of relationship with, uh, with the Jews, to uh, the administration that changed uh, with Claudius coming on. Um, and I know we had uh, some discussion on Suetonius's comments uh, that, you know, reporting a disturbance amongst the Jews once again, uh, Claudius' administration, different than Tiberius and his relationship. Uh, and we have an event where uh, Suetonius is reporting that the Jews are being agitated and breaking out in riots. And what we see in uh, Claudius' uh, administration, different than Tiberius's. I believe this is in Alexandria, though, right? So you're talking about the Alexandrian riots? No, I'm, I'm talking about the expulsion of uh, Jews uh, from Rome. Oh, the expulsion of Jews from Rome. Yes. Got it. Okay, right. So Go, Continue, yeah. Now, now, uh, I, now I know where you're at. Okay. okay. Uh, um, so w when we look at that, obviously uh, Tiberius' administration is different than Claudius's, And obviously there's a disruption here. And uh, we have Suetonius' account that associates this disturbance that caused the expulsion from the Jews uh, from a certain Crestus. And, you know, here I'm trying to understand what other, because if, if we follow the trajectory of Christianity, the spread of it, and the message that they were spreading throughout the empire, you have Paul going to all these different cities and causing all these disturbances with the Jews. I mean, who else would we associate uh, Suetonius's reference to Christus with, if it wasn't the arrival of Christianity in Rome with the Christians? Well, I mean, there's two things to say to that. I mean, one is uh, it's it is exactly what Suetonius says uh, that there was uh, a rabble rouser by the name of Christus in Rome instigating riots, uh, and um, the response to that was to get rid of the Jews or ban them from, from the city. Now, there's uh, there's an issue where uh, Dio Cassius uh, qualifies that and says it wasn't all the Jews. It was only certain ones. Um, but Dio knows what Christians are, and so he doesn't mention Christians in his account. Suetonius doesn't mention Christians in his account. Suetonius knows what Christians are. He talks about them being persecuted under Nero. So Suetonius clearly had no idea that this account had anything to do with Christians. So the only way to explain it as having to do with Christians is that the account has gotten so garbled by the time Suetonius got a hold of it that the Christian connection was completely lost and he had no idea he was confused as to who Christus was or what the riots were about or any of this. So we can't really use that uh, for anything, even if it connected to Christianity, but it probably didn't. It probably had to do with Messianic Judaism in Rome, unconnected with Christians. And that's how the book of Acts portrays it. Uh, the author of Acts doesn't have any knowledge of Christianity causing it. It just mentions that the Jews were expelled from Rome. And so some of them started hanging out with Christians in other provinces. But it just, it doesn't, the author doesn't seem to know that there's anything to do with, uh, um, anything to do with Christianity with regard to that expulsion. So we just, there's not really anything we do with that. Um, and then even if we go through conjecture after conjecture, stack them up and like try to reconstruct some possible scenario that Christianity is connected there, 
we can't get a resurrection investigation out of it. Like what was the riot, what were the riots about? Uh, what specifically? And did the Romans care about that? Like clearly it's a good example where Claudius' solution is just get them out of the city. He doesn't investigate anything. He doesn't care. It's like, you guys are misbehaving. Your behavior is intolerable. Leave. Uh, and that, that's basically what he did. And Rome, it should be pointed out that Roman emperors did this all the time. Uh, there, there's many incidences where they ban philosophers from Rome and uh, they get pissed off at someone uh, doing some particular group doing something where they ban them from Rome, but they let them come back in later. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of almost more like a symbolic gesture, kind of like making people sit in the corner, uh, essentially. Um, so we have a lot of examples of that happening. But in this particular case, we can't connect it to the resurrection claim. We can't connect it to anything to do with Pilate. We can't connect it to uh, any kind of investigation. Uh, there's just not enough there. There, there's not. It's too much garbled information. It's too vague. Uh, we can't do anything with it, unfortunately. So I, I want to talk a little bit about because um, I, I know I, in my uh, original response, I uh, talked quite a bit about uh, the baculi. Now. You know, what interested me about Levy's account of the baculi is uh, we, we get a background in how the Roman Empire, the Republic at that time, uh, was conducting its investigation. So we look at another uh, cult in the eyes of the Romans at that time. We see a very unique procedure uh, that they go about. Uh, the councils, uh, the consuls at that time uh, the highest officials in the Republic, uh, go out there. They have contacts in the area uh, that they were able to get information from, which actually leads them to gather uh, a witness who had been part of uh, these, I don't know, local nightclubs uh, <laughs> that we would experience uh, today and uh, maybe some of us would even join. Uh, but what we see there is the councils are coming out. They have uh, their vegetable, uh, their vegetables. Uh, uh, I apologize for my pronunciation there. Um, but, but what we see there is uh, they have contacts in the area that knew people who were involved. They brought uh, a woman who had seen it, knows where they were. And it's interesting, they, they already had reports of you know, information that they had available when they came uh, to that meeting. So the consul already had information that he's questioning the witnesses fell upon. So when I take this over to Acts and when we look at what's happening now under a changing administration from Tiberius to Claudius uh, and moving into a different administration of the Roman Empire, we see this very similar pattern or trend with uh, Festus uh, meeting with Paul, and he has King Agrippa uh, there, who obviously uh, uh, knew the area uh, of Jesus' uh, ministry. And, you know, what we see here is actually an interrogation that looks very closely with what was happening in the Baculi. Now, Luke obviously would not know of a Roman investigation, just like we wouldn't know if the FBI was investigating us. So why would you not uh, see the similar parallel that gives us the background of what's happening in Acts with high officials meeting with Paul, who was just a lowly Roman citizen. I mean, he wasn't a patrician, uh, coming back and uh, having this big interrogation with him. That's, that's another example that proves my point. Uh, so if you look at the, the Bacchae, the punishment of the Bacchae, the policing of the Bacchae, this is second century BC. In the context, this was a time when everything foreign was, was suspicious. The Romans were suspicious of everything foreign. So to the point that they were even like considering outlying Greek doctors, uh, philosophers and stuff. They didn't like Greek knowledge coming their way. They definitely didn't like Greek uh, secret societies coming their way. Uh, and in particular, the, the only thing they investigated with the Bacchanalia was who was doing it, who was, who was joining these cults, who was secretly a member of it. So how high up was the infiltration? They were, they were seeing it as foreign infiltration into the Senate. Uh, and 
it's all behavior. It's not belief. They didn't investigate the miraculous claims that the Bacchae had. They didn't investigate the religious doctrines. They didn't investigate the religious claims. They were only interested in behavior. Are you a member of an illegal foreign secret society? And that's it. Uh, that, that was what concerned them. And we actually know this, like, not only from Livy, but we actually have inscriptions from the Senate, the original senatorial decree uh, from the Senate itself. So we actually know what concerned them. Uh, and it wasn't beliefs. They weren't interested in that. Uh, and so that makes my point is that Pilate also would react the same way. Like he doesn't care about beliefs. He only cares about behavior. And by Pilate's time, foreigners were not feared in that sense. Like there was a wide uh, acceptance and tolerance of foreign cults. Uh, they were, Romans were adopting them left and right and admitting them to uh, status within Rome uh, and not interfering in religious beliefs and religious squabbles. So uh, things had changed by that point. But even in the original Bacchanalia uh, Senate investigation, it was only behavior, not belief. Um, so it's not a good analogy for your point. It's a perfect analogy for my point, is that the Romans didn't care about beliefs, that this wasn't, wasn't the thing that they did. And the other thing is you mentioned that, that how would Luke know about the investigation? Uh, that's an astonishing claim. It kind of threw me for a minute. So you, you have two possible things here. You Either Acts is completely making up all the court hearings that it depicts, which I'm sympathetic to. I think probably he did. But that doesn't help your case. <laughs> right? If Acts is making everything up, uh, well, then all bets are off. Uh, but if those hearings, if Acts is basing those hearings on any kind of information that, that's authentic, uh, whether oral or some sort of written source or whatever, they very clearly show there was no investigation, and yet they would have done. It, it, had there been a dispute over the resurrection as an investigable issue, it would have come up in these court trials. Uh, Paul would have to defend it. Um, Paul would be attacked with it. Uh, there, we would hear the discussions of it. Instead, we hear the exact opposite. We have Roman officials saying, I'm not interested in investigating this. This is a religious squabble. It doesn't concern our laws. Go away, basically. It was is the way the Romans continually do it. Even the Sanhedrin was, well, we're a little concerned that maybe he defiled the temple. But otherwise, his beliefs, like, uh, maybe an angel or a spirit spoke to him. That's literally what the Sanhedrin says. Like, we don't find anything wrong with this guy uh, in terms of that. So, like, in terms of belief, even the Sanhedrin didn't really care, uh, as long as he wasn't defiling the temple, as long as he wasn't doing things that violate Jewish law. Uh, and, and so the disputes were always over those technical details. It had nothing to do with the resurrection. Um, so there's two, two ways you could look at that. You can throw it all out as all fiction, in which case we have no information, and therefore there's nothing to stand on. Uh, or Acts is pretty powerful evidence showing, uh, and I assume you believe Acts is a historical reliable source. So I think you're kind of forced to accept that Acts definitely shows the Romans weren't interested in investigating this, didn't investigate this. There's no investigation that occurs, um, and much less any result of it. Uh, and the Christians aren't boasting of the results. Uh, it doesn't come up. Uh, and so, uh, and it even, I, I should say, not just that it doesn't come up. I want to reiterate, they even act specifically has Romans say, I'm not interested in this. Like, I don't even know how to investigate this. What do I do with this? It visions, scriptures, I can't work with this. Uh, and and we're to the point of letting Paul go. They let Peter go. Uh, like, there's like, the, they're letting people go left and right. They have nothing really substantial to get them on. Um, and Paul confirms that. Uh, Paul confirms that Peter was in Jerusalem for decades. Uh, clearly, they never got anything on him. Not even false. They couldn't even get him accused, uh, convicted on a false charge, apparently. Uh, so we know that, I mean, this, this is evidence against your thesis, is what I'm saying. Uh, and the only way to get around that is to declare acts fiction, not reliable history. But then you, you've kicked out all foundation. Uh, now we have nothing. We have no record of what happened at that time. None of it survives. Uh, and so then we can't do anything on nothing. We can't build any thesis on the complete absence of information. Yeah. Regarding uh, Luke and Acts, now it, it is interesting, and I think, you know, maybe you agree, not agree, I, I think most would say that Acts comes after, uh, obviously, Luke, and uh, obviously the, the same writer uh, of Acts would be consistent with uh, the writer that we find in Luke. It obviously yeah. references uh, at, at, at the very beginning of... Uh, uh, of Acts, you know, it, the older publication, which in that publication, it, it does give testimony to uh, the empty tomb, uh, the resurrection of Christ, and it kind of opens up uh, that prologue of Acts 1 with it. Now, w what's interesting about uh, uh, the hearing between uh, between Paul and Festus and uh, 
Agrippa is why would Festus respond in the manner he did if Paul was only referring to a spiritual metaphorical resurrection? And, and the reason why I say this is because, you know, in Acts, you know, the Athenian philosophers at the Roman Hill, when they cast their judgment on Paul's preaching of Jesus and the resurrection, um, responded in a very similar way that uh, Festus did. Because Festus, why would they have even cared or brought uh, Paul there uh, if they were only believing in uh, spiritual deities or mains or love? Well, Acts, Acts says why, right? The, the Jews tried to, uh, well, first of all, they tried to kill Paul. They actually tried to have a, a band of assassins to try and kill him. Uh, and that precipitated this. The Romans got involved and said, why is this going on? And then there was this religious squabble. And, and the Romans are trying to figure out, like, I don't understand why you guys are trying to kill each other. I don't get it. Uh, and so uh, they bring Paul in um, and sort of sit on the case for a while because it clearly it calmed down the violence part of it. And that's really all they cared about. But when the Jews came to accuse Paul, all they had to accuse him of was violating, uh, basically, the uh, defiling the temple, which which. Paul claimed he didn't do. Um, that's the only actual legal issue that keeps Paul at trial. And then it's Paul who tries to make it all about the beliefs, um, but the Jews aren't making it about the beliefs. And the beliefs, Paul himself says, are based on, I am I have special insight into the secret meanings of scripture, and I have spirits talking to me. And that, that's literally all he has. And so when Festus hears all this, he's like, you're insane, Paul. Like you're, you're, you've just given me tinfoil hat readings of say, holy books and you're talking about, you're talking to ghosts and spirits and stuff. Like, I, I don't know what to do about this. And he even says like, I would totally let you go because I don't see you've done anything wrong, but you appeal to Caesar. So I have to, I have to move your case up. Um, that's the reaction. That's, that's what we get. And so that's how, why Festus reacts that way. It totally makes sense. Uh, it's actually one of the most coherent stories uh, in the book of Acts in terms of how people behave. Uh, historically, it's exactly how a Roman magistrate would behave uh, faced with this kind of stuff. Um, so, um, and that's all we have. We don't have, uh, that record is, is telling exactly the opposite story um, from what you need to be, to have been told in order to base your case on. Uh, so the documents just don't bear it out, uh, is my position on that. Now, the empire, obviously under uh, Maximum's reign, uh, 311, did attempt to falsify or provide a counter narrative and spread propaganda uh, throughout the empire in an attempt to falsify the resurrection of Jesus and spread propaganda against Christianity. Now, you, you did note uh, that, you know, because of the rising tide of uh, Christian's popularity, they were starting to become uh, political problems. But don't we see the same political problems uh, that uh, uh, Pliny reports in Bithia? Uh, obviously, when Tacitus reports on the Christians, uh, he kind of opens that up with, you know, Nero um, falsely accusing the Christians of setting the fire. And if you think about it, Nero would have needed a big enough group uh, to assign uh, blame to. Because uh, obviously it would have to be a group that was known. Uh, obviously, well, also it had to be a small enough group that he could get away with it, uh, right? So it's like David Koresh, right? Uh, if if that was the Mormon Church, the federal government wouldn't have gotten away with raiding the compound of Waco. The only reason they could like in invade the Waco compound and act the way they did was because the Koresh people were small enough in number, um, but still locally renowned enough to be a group to target, essentially. Now, the, there were legitimate uh, uh, illegal guns, and they had legitimate like, legal reasons, but the way they handled it was like completely disastrously bad. Um, but it would have been completely different behavior if it was the Mormon church that they were going after. And so this is, uh, by the time of Maximin, um, we're talking about like five to 10% of the population is Christian. Now that's, that's serious mojo. That's a huge social issue. Whereas in Pliny's time, Pliny makes clear, like he, his whole life and, and his entire legal career, and he had one of the most prestigious legal careers across the empire, he'd never been present at a trial of Christians. He didn't know anything about what they believed. 
Um, so he just just sort of knew by report that they were a problem, but he didn't even know why. Uh, that's how rare Christians were at that point. So yeah, you could you could do like a witch hunt and like you know single out some Christians and scapegoat them. Um, or uh, if people start accusing them of illegal assembly, you know, Pliny had to do something about it, so he did because you can't have people flout the law like that. But it's clear that they they were so small. Even Trajan says, "Don't hunt these people out. Leave them be." Uh, like we weren't worried about them. It was just you know a sort of fringe foreign cult that didn't really bother them. They weren't doing anything particularly illegal. I mean, they were violating illegal assembly. They're being dicks about not on, paying homage to the emperor. But even Trajan says, "Don't hunt these people down," because uh, they, they weren't that worried about them. And it was it wasn't until you know Christians became a really large part of the population uh, that you started getting these attempts to uh, mock and satirize them. That's the, the, the maximum forgery of the Acts of Pilate is kind of like the total adult issue. It's, it's not um, attacking the resurrection, it's attacking the entirety of Christian gospel by making a mock version of the gospel and sort of making fun of them. Uh, and it probably picked all, there was a lot of like bullshit stuff that got said about Christians throughout the centuries. It, it probably drew it all in there and just threw it all at it and trying to make them unpopular. Uh, by publishing this sort of fake news version of it, right? They're trying to like uh, ridicule Christians so that people will not want to be Christians uh, or to drum up support for suppressing the Christians. That's the goal there. They weren't really interested in like disproving the resurrection. And it's clear they couldn't because they didn't have access to any real documents to even address the issue. Uh, all they all they had were the gospels. That's the thing is like, he, all they could do is mock the gospels. That was the only sources that were available at the time. Uh, and we see this even earlier in Celsus. Celsus only knows of the gospels. He has no other sources for Christianity. Oh, I think that had arisen up in a disorganized way by Jewish authors and things. So um, anyway, that's that's it's an issue of scale. So by the time Maximin arises, Christians are a much larger problem than they had been before. Uh, and so the, the interests change. But even then, they're not investigating the resurrection and, and couldn't have done by then. It's too late, right? It's long too late in history for them to have done anything practical about that. Hey, James, can I have just one more question on Trajan? Just you bet. It, it makes for, is that okay, Dr. Carey? Yeah, sure. So, um, obviously, Pliny's letter to uh, Trajan uh, elicits a response. Now, uh, looking at that response and seeing the history of the different administrations on how they dealt with uh, Christianity up to that time, uh, does it seem like Trajan? Uh -oh. Actions seem to indicate that his first goal was to present a, a prevent a revolt, and then he was mm -hmm. attempting to quell a group that was spreading throughout the empire and may have already infiltrated. No. Yeah, no. no, actually, um, so this is where it's important to actually read the context because, um, this is this. I took Bart Ehrman to task for making this mistake, but uh, he conflated a couple letters of Pliny. We have several letters of Pliny. Uh, only one deals with the Christians, uh, but there's another one that deals with firefighter societies. And this is very important because this is the context in which what's happening to the Christians in Pliny's tenure is, is happening. Uh, and so Pliny writes to Trajan and says, okay, I know there, were, there are all these rebellions and political unrest in my province. And so you've banned societies. Uh, like you're not, basically what he said, he's not issuing licenses. Normally you could assemble with a license from the state. So you could have, so religious groups could assemble and so on if you sought a license from the state. In Pliny's province, it was very uniquely being treated. Trajan was basically punishing the populace for having for up previous uprisings and saying no associations at all. I'm not giving any licenses. And they must have given some because I'm sure they were still engaged in religious practices and other forms of assembly. But those are probably old licenses that were established licenses. He wasn't assigning any new ones. And Pliny said, well, look, that your law is actually preventing firefighter clubs from assembling to fight fires in the city, and this is becoming a problem. Um, how, what do we do about this? And then Trajan writes back and says, actually, it is the firefighting societies that were like, there was a lot of political activism. There, It was kind of like a cover, uh, like unions, in a sense, were becoming a cover for, for political activism. It says, no, so no firefighting societies, just you know, keep the equipment on hand and, and people can assemble spontaneously when there's a fire. I'm not going to have firefighter houses or anything like that. Um, and that's his response. And so when Pliny is dealing with the Christians, the best he can, he doesn't know what to do, actually. He doesn't know why he's supposed to be punishing Christians. He doesn't even know why they're illegal. And he writes to Trajan, is like, well, I mean, I know I'm supposed to do something, but I don't know why I'm supposed to care about these guys. Uh, and that's when Trajan writes back and, and says, well, yeah, just don't, don't bother with them. Um, 
don't hunt them down basically. But you know, if you get clear evidence of people violating my, you know, rule against illegal assembly, do something about that or, uh, you know, any kind of like thumbing their nose at the imperial power and things like that. So he's not interested in Christians as a group, actually specifically not interested. Like that's why Trajan says, don't hunt these people down. Uh, he's only interested in people obeying his law to prevent general political uprisings, not Christian uprisings, but just general political meddling is what he's against. That's why it's, it's, he says the same thing against the firefighter societies as against the Christians. Uh, it's not that there's any particular beliefs that he sees as a problem. It's that he's worried about political activism. And if you let people organize and assemble, they get political and I don't want that to happen. Now, of course, you know, this is an oppressive system. This is, there's no First Amendment uh, uh, constitutional thing here. Um, but that's what he's doing. He's doing a typical tyrannical thing. It's like, no, no assembly because those become political and I don't like that. Um, but it's clear that Trajan didn't particularly see the Christians as, an, as a threat politically. Like he's like, if they're flaunting the law, yeah, you got to do something. But otherwise, I don't particularly, it's clear he didn't particularly see them as a threat at that time. Uh, and, and so um, same with it, you know, he, it's like he doesn't order plenty to go hunt down firefighter societies either. Um, he just says, just don't let them do it. Uh, that's flouting the law. Um, and that's the context in which this happens. So no, it's not really a, a general concern about Christians. It's a, it's a general concern for the whole populace engaging in an illegal assembly and, and the political ramifications of that. Um, even if you couldn't tie it to any specific political beliefs, Trajan just wanted to prevent the whole thing altogether. At least that was his current policy. It might have changed within a few years or whatever, but um, that's the context in which that happened. So, so no, you, you actually, the, the evidence in Pliny and Trajan is the opposite of what you're saying. Oh, I didn't know, James, if we keep going or... <laughs> we do, we yeah. do have a little bit have, left. Do we have Q&A? When, when, what's the schedule? I don't know where we're at. We can jump into Q&A. Unless you have any last questions, we have eight minutes left. But oh, yeah. no, if you okay. uh, if you uh, if you have them, let them rip. Otherwise, we can go to Q and A. I don't have any uh, questions at this time, but Jonathan, you you've got the mic. <laughs> um, I, uh, well, yeah, I know we talked about uh, the Nazareth inscription. Um, you know, I, I was interested in hearing uh, some of your views on the Nazareth inscription because you know, a, as I responded, it's you know, either a direct response uh, seemed consistent with a direct response to the empty grave or a later response uh, that we see by the spread of Christianity uh, starting at the time right around Claudius. Um, now, now, it's interesting uh, that some of the proposed theories against that, because uh, I know you have made the assertion that the Romans had known about circumstances of this kind, they would be inclined to investigate and set out to uh, um, uh, rule it out and bring in the witnesses. Uh, I think it's uh, your, why did Mark uh, uh, do the open tune or why did he invent the open tune? Where yeah. pilot would have been compelled to bring in witnesses, find out who did it, whether they were innocent or not. So when we look at the Nazareth description, it seems consistent with the idea that the Roman Empire did know about it. Uh, and what we have is a, a large piece of marble uh, being uh, brought into Nazareth, uh, where obviously uh, Jesus uh, was from. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I see where you're at on this. I think we should get people up to speed. They might not know what we're talking about. Um, okay. So um, I think there might even be a Wikipedia page on it. I don't know if it's any good. I haven't looked at it. But um, the Nazareth inscription is this inscription. It's actually a small slab of stone. It's not uh, of marble. It's not large. Um, uh, and it has misspellings and stuff in it. So it's kind of crudely executed. Um, it was probably someone privately owned it. It probably wasn't. It was. It contained an imperial decree, but it was probably a private person who wanted to erect it. Uh, and it was written in Greek, so clearly it was targeting not Jewish locals, it was targeting Greeks uh, and uh, targeting people who could read as well. But um, so, uh, so several things. Um, this is an inscription that contains an imperial decree. It, it's nonspecific as to who the emperor was, which actually means it was almost certainly Caesar or Augustus, actually, not Tiberius. Um, because if it was Tiberius, it would have his name carved on it. But the only Caesars who just went by Caesar 
was Julius and his adopted son Augustus was the only ones that had decrees and just says in the name of Caesar. Um, so it's almost certainly predates Christianity by years, decades probably. Um, and it, it has a decree about grave robbing, specifically out, m reminding people, these are our laws against grave robbing. I am demanding that you enforce these laws, basically is what it says. Um, and uh, I, have a, I have a whole article on it at the secular web. Uh, I have a, a updated version of that article in my book, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. So people who want to see with the, I cite the scholarship, I cite, uh, there's lots of peer-reviewed scholarship on this. All the actual ancient historians, like the real scholars who actually publish peer-reviewed articles on this, all agree it doesn't have anything to do with Christianity. Uh, in fact, uh, it doesn't come from Nazareth. This, this is a miscon misconception. It was bought in Nazareth. Um, and in at the time it was bought, it was early 20th century, there were only two antiquities markets in Judea. There was Jerusalem and Nazareth, and that was it. So everything comes from Nazareth or Jerusalem that came out of there from that date. If you bought something, it came from one of those two cities. That does not mean that's where it was found. In fact, we don't know where it was found. Uh, the fact that it's written in Greek uh, and it assumes people can read Greek, which is more than even just speaking Greek, very likely it probably came from the Decapolis. It probably did not even come from Judea. Uh, it, it, or at least it might have come from one of the, uh, the Gentile cities within Judea, like Sepphoris or something. Um, so, uh, so that's so we got to get that misconception out. It wasn't wasn't uh, discovered in Nazareth, and it, it pro almost certainly was not published in Nazareth. Like I can't imagine anyone publishing a Greek uh, uh, imperial decree in Nazareth. Um, but anyway, that's that's the consensus is that that's it's we can't establish that it came from Nazareth. And uh, also, the content of it is very specifically targeting Greek uh, family cult, um, so ancestor cult. So the Greeks had particular religious practices involving graves, where there was the paying homage and reverence, uh, uh, literally worship of ancestors. You would go to the grave, you would eat on the grave, and there were even like little tubes you could drop food down for the, for the dead to have meals and things like this. Um, and the, the law goes to step by step. Uh, you to preserve the cult of ancestors, which is a Greek thing, not a Jewish thing, don't do all of these things. And it lists like 10 things, none of which have anything to do with uh, the Christian story, except the disturbing of like the removal of bodies. But that's, that was, there had been laws against removal of bodies for years. And then years after that, that was just a common fact. But the fact that the law, uh, it's just reiterating existing Roman laws against sacrilege that involved a lot of details like stealing door, t uh, door stones, uh, switching stones, um, uh, damaging graves, like it's all of, there's a variety of different details, molesting bodies, like not just taking the bodies, but like doing things with them, uh, which is actually a prohibition against magic, probably, because uh, necromancers loved corpses. It was a big black market and corpse products. Uh, it's very clearly targeting Greek populations with Greek ideas of how uh, grave worship works. It would have been sacrilegious to a Jewish audience anyway. And it's dealing with a wide range of issues that don't connect with the empty tomb story in Christianity. And there's no mention of Christians, by the way. So like, uh, it, there's no mention of like, due to a recent terrible event, I am just declaring this. No, it's just, these are our laws, please enforce them. <laughs> it's basically all it is. So there isn't any way to get from the Nazareth inscription itself to anything to do with Christianity. It almost certainly was published before Christianity. And it's about existing Roman laws and enforcing them locally uh, under Roman jurisdictions even maybe under client king jurisdictions, but allowing Roman uh, influence and decrees and so on. So we, we can't connect it to Christianity is, is the point. Uh, so no, I, I don't I don't agree that you can use it the way that, that you are. I know a lot of Christian apologists want to use it that way, um, but the facts just don't hold up. We can go into the Q&A if yeah. you guys are ready, but no rush in case you had any other uh, questions, Jonathan. Uh, well, no, we, we could probably talk all night about this. Um, yeah. I, I, I think m one last point that I, I would like to, uh, to make to Dr. Carrier is, you know, if, when we look at the, the circumstances around the account uh, in the gospel publications, uh, what, what's consistent between uh, all four accounts is, you know, the empty tomb, um, you know, Joseph of Arimathea, we have uh, Judea, uh, we have a tomb. Uh, now, any one of those uh, events or criteria could be easily falsified. Like, let's say if there was no tomb at all. Um, I mean, 
we're, we're talking about a major city uh, in the empire. Um, they, they list the name Joseph of Arimathea, uh, who would have purchased it. Obviously, he would have had to have a lot of money to have a tomb, uh, let alone in a major city like that. And, you know, what we don't find is any counter narrative that would have been easily able to disprove it. I mean, if there was no tomb, there goes Christianity. Uh, if there was no person by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, uh, there goes uh, the account. And one of the reasons I brought up uh, uh, Eusebius's reporting on Hegesebius's uh, account of Domitian uh, investigating uh, the grandsons of Jude is demonstrating this knowledge uh, in the ancient world that you could investigate the relatives. So even if the accounts were published well after the fact, you know, the Romans could have easily, or uh, the Jews could have easily gained access to this information to find out if any of these accounts ever did occur, even if the gospels were published 60, 70 years afterwards. Not really. Uh, that's a long time. Uh, I don't know if you realize like half a century more than you know we're talking about half a century before it gets published the when you have the gospel of mark which is the first time we ever hear anything about an empty tomb um he's publishing not only a life average lifetime later um he's publishing after a major war has completely ravaged the region he's publishing in a foreign language in a foreign land he's not publishing in palestine um we don't even know when anyone in palestine ever got to read a gospel uh, they were being published and read by churches outside that area. Uh, and moreover, for about 50 years, we have no record of anyone's reaction to the Gospels, not even to defend them. There wasn't like family saying, yeah, I was there, that Gospel's correct. Or like, we don't have pro or con. We, we're not allowed to see what any reaction was to the Gospels. It just wasn't preserved. And we can't make arguments from documents we don't have. Like, we don't know what these people said or what any gainsaying that might have been said. It wasn't recorded or wasn't preserved because we have no record pro or con, I want to emphasize this. So it's not that they, it's not recorded because they were shocked into silence and couldn't say anything. No, it's like even the people who could have backed these stories up, if they said anything, we don't get to hear them either. So we don't know anything. Uh, so you can't make that argument. Um, it, it's not this, it's not the kind of situation where it's like 10 years later in the town where it happened, someone's going around telling the story. That's not what's happening. This is a lifetime later, you know, probably another continent, uh, but certainly another province, a foreign province and foreign language and Greek, you know, and so on. Um, so no, we don't, we don't have that. And then even if you want to see what was the reaction of the gospels, we don't get to see that either because all of that record has been destroyed. Like whatever reactions there were to these gospels, we have total silence on the record. So we, we, we don't get to see any of that. Um, it's uh, to give you an example, like you're talking about consistency across the gospels. The Gospels are redactions of each other. So like even, even the Gospel of John is rewriting the Gospels in his own words, which is actually how most ancient writers operated. The previous, the Synoptic Gospels are just rewriting, they're just taking the Gospel and just jiggering it and just making their own version of it. We have other examples of this, like the lives of Esau. Uh, in the Middle Ages, we have like the lives of Genevieve, where there's a version and then someone expands on it and adds and changes and takes away stuff, but it's still pretty much nearly identical in many respects. And then other versions keep happening. So we have like the lives, lives of Aesop is like that. Um, we don't say that the lives of Aesop are recording history because all of them are consistent with each other. We know what's going on. It's redaction. They're taking a story and they're changing it over time. Everybody agrees the lives of Aesop are fiction, right? Uh, so, so the consistency amongst the lives of Aesop does not support the historicity of anything in the, the lives of Aesop. Same with Genevieve, is, frankly, because it's the same story that someone's coming along, copying and changing around. That doesn't, that's not corroboration, that's redaction. Uh, and so, um, so we don't, we don't really get that. All, all we get is we have, you know, in the 70s, maybe at the earliest, Mark publishes a story about the empty tomb, claims no one told anyone about the empty tomb, so it's vague as to how he's supposed to even know of it. But I don't think Mark intends it as history anyway. I think Mark is writing allegory. I don't think he, he means you to think that this is a historical fact. But um, regardless of whether that's the case or not, he writes this story and then every version of the empty tomb story copies that one either verbatim or very nearly uh, the same and just changes some elements of it, adds some things, takes some things away. <clears throat> so it's just a redaction of the same story over and over again. We don't have any corroboration of the story. 
we don't even, and I should say, we don't have like an eyewitness saying, yeah, I was there, that, that's right, that is what happened, or, or actually, yeah, that was what happened except for this detail or whatever. No, we don't have that. Uh, we don't get to see that. So we can't argue that it's history. Uh, it could easily be fiction, and we wouldn't know. There isn't any way to access uh, that other than to look at internally, does this make sense as history? I don't think it does. I think it only makes sense as fiction, but um, that's a whole separate, that'll be a whole separate debate that's beyond what we're doing here. With that, folks, it's a great time to transition into Q&A. So thank you both, Dr. Carrier and Jonathan. This has been a true pleasure getting to listen to your guys' continuing debate. As mentioned, folks, their debate had started being a written debate, and they were gracious enough to where we get to kind of join in with them during that, in which the you could say the, kind of the sequel or last part of it is here on Modern Day Debate. So with that... Want to quick read Scott Duke? Thanks so much for your question. Who said, Love this particular debate, it's narrow in scope, and there was prequel material. Thank you to everyone involved. Will there be more like this in the future, James? I sure hope so, Scott, because this is, like I said, a special one that we've never gotten to do before. So, Stephen Steen, thanks so much for your compliment. Says, James is a beautiful man with a beautiful channel. Okay, well, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Next up is Smokey nice. Saint. <laughs> Smokey Saint, thanks for your uh, question. Let's see. It's like, I couldn't quite, this is a little bit harder to understand. If you if you put it into live chat, I'll keep an eye on it and I'll, I'll get that for you. Thanks so much. And Fothel <laughs> Guy, thanks for your Compliment. They said, I love Richard Carrier and that he goes over every small detail. Dishonest <laughs> people would call that, quote, sophistry. Educated people would call it good scholarship and research. And I know it's uh, absolutely appreciated to have the rigor of tonight's discussion, as I know that a lot of people have been giving tons of positive feedback. So that's just one of many. And. Well, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Next up, oh, I did want to say, let's see, did want to say thanks so much. I think it was Biker Hog. Thanks so much for subscribing. Saw that pop up. We appreciate you having you here. And as mentioned, no matter what walk of life you're from, folks, we really do hope you feel welcome. And next up, thanks for your question from Maya Asburns. Says, congratulations, Dr. Carrier, and I'm a big fan of the channel, James. Well, thanks so much for your kindness and Absolutely. Uh, big congrats to Dr. Carrier indeed. As it's like, I've always said, I've said, I think no joke. I'm not just saying this. You could ask my friends. I've said, I was like, I think historically Dr. Carrier is one of the toughest and maybe the toughest, at least in the English speaking world in terms of debating these topics. Oh, so hmm. this is a, a real honor. And so Scott Duke, thanks for your question for Dr. Carrier. They asked, is the criterion <laughs> of embarrassment a valid method of evaluating historical data for any other field than Christian apologetics? Um, yes, uh, except it has to be applied correctly. I, I have a whole huge section on this, actually, in um, my book, Proving History. I actually go into the methodology of it and show like examples of how, when it applies. And we have examples in courts of law, too. Um, statements against interest is, is a similar concept in law. Uh, so there, there are valid applications of it, but um, but they have to be struck. There have to be certain facts in place for them to operate. Uh, and the, the problem with when we apply it to the Gospels, usually is what's being attempted. Um, those those ple those pieces that you need to be in place are not there. Uh, and so you give an example. Um, usually it said that uh, John the Baptist, the Jesus being uh, for the Gospels to admit that Jesus submitted to the baptism of John uh, is embarrassing, therefore it must be true. But actually, when you look at the actual evidence of what the inventor of that story, Mark, is doing with it, it's not embarrassing at all. It's not embarrassing to Mark. He invented it for a reason, and it actually serves clear functions. Um, there, and I've, there's been many peer-reviewed scholars who've made this point. I actually cite them and discuss them and their position uh, in uh, improving history. So if you want to go into that and look at that. So it's every time that someone makes that claim, you start picking at the threads, it doesn't hold up. Uh, it doesn't hold up as an example, a valid example of an actual argument from embarrassment or one that would hold up logically. Uh, and that's usually the problem with the criteria generally is like either they are illogical or if you fix them to be logical, they no longer apply to the gospels or there's no instance in the gospels to which they apply. 
Uh, and that's the problem that I've found. So it's not always that the criteria that don't apply or aren't used. It's that they're misused largely, um, they're overused, wrongly used, and so on. Uh, in ways that would, you would never see in other fields of history. I, I do agree with that. Oh, well, no, I shouldn't say never. Uh, there's a great book by uh, Hockett Fisher called Historian's Fallacies that I highly recommend people read because it's very uh, entertaining and covers many fields of history. And it's just filled with historians making logical fallacies, like established peer-reviewed uh, history. Um, so yeah, it's not that, they, that you never see fallacious arguments uh, uh, in, in all fields of history. Uh, but typically it's not used in the sort of intensive way that it, you see it used in Jesus studies. Gotcha. Thanks so much for that. And next up, oh, are you guys okay with other questions on historical matters, such as we do have like one or two questions that are outside of this scope of this debate, but they are on, for example, whether or not there are historical sources for Jesus outside of the New Testament, or would you like to keep it focused on this topic? Let's say two things. One, you could stack those towards the end if we run out of relevant questions. And the other is like, if Jonathan has anything to add what I, to what I just said about the criterion of embarrassment, um, he's welcome to, to weigh in, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would say, uh, probably uh, one of the more remarkable statements that I've liked uh, used by the ancients is Tertullian. Uh, I think he's uh, quite quoted on this that it's true because it's absurd, which kind of carries that idea that uh, who would make something like this up? Now, obviously, I don't use it in my uh, apologetics approach, but I, I, I do understand uh, Tertullian's legal mind uh, when he's making that argument. Uh, so when it comes from him, it, it does sound really good, uh, but that's not my particular approach that I use. You bet. And... Thanks so much for your, let's see, just came in. Uh, gosh, uh, they make me read these. Otherwise, they tell me they, they want a refund of their super chats. C. Darwin, <laughs> thanks for your super chat, who said, uh, James, have you ever thought about modeling? I think they like seeing my face turn red. I, uh, you guys are good trolls. I like that we have at least benevolent trolls here. And oh, thanks, yes, that's nice, yeah. <laughs> thanks for your uh, question from Bothell Guy. Let's see, or comment in this case said, I think Richard carried the day today as he um. spent most of his time correcting Sheffield. But it's a great debate, fellas. You have a critic out there, Jonathan. You have a fan out there, Dr. Carrier. Thank you for that <laughs> pun as well. And oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you did there. Let's see. We have another one. This one came in from NZ Pure. Thanks for your question. Said... Can Jonathan explain why he thinks the scripture is a viable source of evidence for itself? Well, you know, what we're talking about is documentation uh, that was published throughout uh, the, the, the empire. Um, you know, it, even though this, this may go into a, a different, it's, it's one piece of positive empirical evidence in support of our testimony. Now, I've never come out and said that's the only relevant evidence, but it is positive empirical evidence uh, supporting our claims. Uh, and in this discussion, you know, I'm actually moving the discussion uh, to show evidence or in a lot of cases, uh, the inability of the Roman Empire to falsify this narrative as a means from a disinterested source uh, to corroborate what the Christians were promoting all throughout its empire without a counter narrative to expose it if it truly was a hoax. Gotcha. And thanks so much for your question. This one comes in from Ultra Testosterone. <laughs> Appreciate it. As what historical evidence is there? I'm reading them in order. I'm I'm keeping an eye just in case other ones more <clears throat> more central to the topic come in. But they did ask what historical evidence is there for Jesus outside of the New Testament? Uh, that's that's tricky. Um, 
so there are references, of course, uh, that we have in extant texts. Um, but what they mean, wh what value they have, these things can be debated, uh, and whether they're authentic too. Uh, so that's a big topic. Um, the answer is not much, uh, but the earliest, the earliest example of an extra biblical reference that survives or that is in our text today, uh, there's a lot of qualifications here, uh, is the the references in Josephus's Antiquities, which was published around 93 A.D. The question is, were those passages in the antiquities when they were published in 93 AD? Uh, and then the second question is, even if the answer, the answer is yes, the second question is, what, what sources did Josephus use for that other than the Gospels? And since he's publishing after the Gospels and doesn't say anything that's not in the Gospels, we can't establish that he had any sources outside the gospel. So it, it doesn't corroborate the New Testament. It's just repeating the New Testament. Um, and so, and that's what we find for the rest of, after that, you get Tacitus, Suetonius, and so on. Um, we're in the same conundrum. We can't establish that they had any sources other than the gospels, uh, or even that they wrote the things that, that supposedly they wrote. So uh, it's problematic. Let's put it that way. It's obviously there's a whole debate we could have on any one of those passages, much less all of them. Gotcha. And Jonathan, if you do want to add, you can. This is something that we can, if you guys want to banter back yeah, and forth, too. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, once again, uh, you know, we see a strong allusion, uh, a reference in Tacitus. Uh, obviously, the Josephus uh, citation is uh, highly disputed uh, with, within the community. Um, obviously, there's uh, Jewish nomadic sources that... Uh, refer to a Jesus as a sorcerer. Uh, and then obviously there's the gospel publication. So, um, you, you know, once again, um, you know, we could probably spend hours on this discussion. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the focus here was really on, uh, yeah. you, you know, the, the resurrection, because yeah, I know Dr. Carrier has his views. I obviously have mine, but, uh, this could be a three-hour discussion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, in um, fact, I, I can circle it back to our topic. Um, I, I don't. I guess I didn't say this, but the, this whole time in the written debate in here, I'm operating from just the granted assumption that there was a historical Jesus. Like I'm not even. That's not even part of my argument. Um, but I'm fine with like conceding that for the sake of argument. Uh, you know, it, it's that's not a problem for me. Um, and also, like I even officially, I come to a one a conclusion. It's one in three odds that there was. So it's like it's low, but respectable odds anyway uh, that there was a historical Jesus. But um, if you change the question from evidence for Jesus to evidence of the resurrection, now it changes because only the Josephus, the highly disputed Josephus passage, uh, the Testimonium Flavianum, only that mentions the resurrection. Tacitus never mentions it. Suetonius never mentions it. Pliny never mentions it. Um, the first time we get any outside source mentioning it would be Celsus, and he's clearly just repeating what the God, he's, he's just ragging on the Gospels. He got a hold of these Gospels, and he thought they were ridiculous, and he wrote this whole screed against the Gospels. He has no other sources. Uh, so, um, so when it comes to, like, the resurrection claim, it's clear there wasn't any outside information. It only came from Christians, uh, and, and no, there was no other way to corroborate or, or check that, and I think that applies to what we were talking about earlier. Jonathan would say that there must have been some sort of records, even though no one quotes them. And I'm saying it doesn't look like there even were. Uh, and even if there were, they were lost by the time the second century comes around. Um, so so that, that's what we're disputing here. And that has to do with the resurrection claim specifically. So if you just assume historicity and just question whether the what something to do with the resurrection was true, then, then you get a slightly different answer uh, than if you frame it as about the historicity of Jesus himself. Gotcha. And next question. This is there are a couple of these that are we will uh, keep them like central at the same time. They're interesting. And as other ones that are central come in, they had asked. And I think this if I remember right, Dr. Harrier, this is your your doctoral research. Your dissertation maybe was on it was in Roman history. Am I yes. right? OK. And yeah. So, uh, yeah. Ancient science in the early Roman Empire. Perfect. And so that must be, they know that as well, I'm sure, because they asked, if you have time for a non, they said, if you have time for this question, will you ask Dr. Carrier if he has any favorite books on Roman history? And mm -hmm. they put in parentheses, outside primary sources. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you, you mean like scholars, scholarly books. 
Um, oh man, I hate questions like this because then like I have a million things in my head and I'm like, I don't know where to start. Uh, <laughs> so um, so something comes, this is very random, but it just comes to my head for a variety of reasons is The Catapult by Tracy Reel. I highly recommend this book. It's a thick book. It looks scary, but she's witty. Uh, she's British. So, you know, everybody from Britain apparently is witty uh, and very erudite. Uh, and <clears throat> the reason I bring this up is uh, she talks about the history of the catapult. She starts like ancient Greece and goes all the way up into the Roman period and slightly into the Middle Ages. So it covers some Roman history. But a lot of and, um, the interactions also between Greek and Roman history is very important. But she covers all angles of the history of the catapult, not just the technology, not just the science, but also the sociology, the anthropology, uh, the, po the politics. Uh, so her book kind of like touches on every aspect of history of the Greeks and Romans all the way through, but connects them in some way or another to the catapult as a technological weapon. Uh, and this, and she's a really excellent writer. That's the other thing. So, so it's, it's this fascinating, her thoroughness in covering all angles of history on one subject and her brilliance as a writer uh, I aspire to like I, I I I'm not at that level I don't think like I that's kind of like the target I try to hit and I don't get there, but uh, but I, she's one of my favorite historians because like that's a really impressive achievement she she did, um, and so I, I mentioned that that's one another one I would mention that intersects with what we're talking about today is Robin Lane Fox's Pagans and Christians. Now most people hate this book uh, because it seems rambling. He just goes from topic to topic to topic to topic and it you don't see a through line necessarily. If you look at it, it there is a relevant through line, uh, but it is kind of like, let's just sa like, sample a smorgasbord of Roman history that connects the difference and similarities between paganism and Christianity and their history together. Uh, and in that sense, it's really good. It's really informative. And it's, it's, it's kind of like somebody sits down and just tells you story after story after story, like a storyteller, but with references, it's like an actual peer reviewed history. Uh, and it's not immediately obvious how the stories connect, but if you if you get the whole, all of them together, you see a picture. And that's what he's doing. He's like painting this sort of picture where there's like all these little things going on on the picture, and you have to see all of it to really get what's going on. And so I, I recommend Pagans and Christians by Robin Lane Fox if you want to get a really good sort of feel for uh, how Christian history looks written through uh, the eyes of a, someone whose field is ancient history and not theology, for example. Um, usually you don't run into that. Uh, so those, those are two examples that I would list. I could probably come up with a zillion more if I kept going, but. Gotcha. And thanks so much, Bobby M. A question more central to what we've, uh, had discussed tonight in particular. I remember that when this came up, uh, I was intrigued and they are too. They said, you mentioned an article who, uh, you mentioned an article that says that, 19th century history is unreliable. Do you have the title or the best place that I could find it? Yeah, it's a blog article I wrote. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, if you look, I don't remember the exact title, uh, History Before 1950. So if you do Richard Carrier, History Before 1950, Google will probably land you there. Um, the other place you can find it is in my book, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. It's actually reproduced in that book, um, which has a bunch of other, it has all my peer-reviewed uh papers in history and a bunch of other interesting articles so hitler homer is a, a great a lot of people really like that book so you might be interested in just getting that uh but either way you could find it um and in that i explain where i got that it was one of the first things i was told when i went to columbia university and my dissertation advisor sat me down and one of the first things he said is like don't trust history before 1950 it was like he had this whole explanation is like like this is the first thing you need to understand if you're going to be a professional in our field is that 1950 is kind of like this cutoff between when our methods became more professional and reliable, before which it was more opinion, uh, it was more uh, driven by ideology uh, and, and so on, and, and it's less clear in its methodology. Uh, and so there's a lot of bad history written before 1950. Not all of it's bad, but a lot of it is to the point that if you're gonna cite someone before 1950, you really need to double check what you're citing them on with more recent history. So you need to be able to back up. You, you can't just rely on someone writing before 1950. You've got to be able to back it up with something in, in later history. Um, and there are some few exceptions like philology and stuff, but uh, I talk about all of that in the article. Gotcha. Super interesting. And thanks for your question from Big Boy, who asks, Where, uh, were women a trusted source in antiquity? <laughs> And they'd like to ask both. 
speakers. Oh, okay. Well, I'm yeah. curious. What, what's Jonathan's take on that? <laughs> I think I think it was before we went live. Jonathan and I were talking about. I just did an article on NT Wright, and I have we're having a debate over this. Well, not really a debate, but an exchange. <laughs> I say something, he says something. I say something, that kind of thing. Uh, I just did a blog on that whole question. Um, and so, and that's recent. So you can go to my blog at richardcarrier.info, look down a few entries and you'll find it if you want to get in on that. But but Jonathan, what's what's your take? Yeah, I, you know, once again, there was the accounts and mark of uh, the ones reporting it. Um, obviously, you know. We're not know, reporting I, it. Mark says well, that he didn't report it, but yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 uh, the report is that, you know, there were women uh, that had uh, seen him first. Now, obviously, I'm not the expert on this field on uh, women's testimony in the ancient world. Sort of familiar with the argument. Uh, I, I did see uh, N.T. Wright, uh, another Anglican's podcast, but I'll actually defer to you uh, on this. This is not my subject area of expertise on women's testimony in the ancient world. It kind of seems like even in modern days, uh, that, that could be questioned in some sort. But I'll defer to you, Dr. Carey, you have a little more insight on this subject. Yeah, so anyone who wants to explore that, go find my blog. And and the, the argument hinges, for people who might not know what we're talking about, I just realized we're, we're talking at a meta level here. Some some of your viewers might not know what we mean. Um, there, N.T. Wright made the argument that Mark would not have invented women and would not have put them in the story of the empty tomb uh, because no one would have believed what a woman reported and therefore it would create a stigma. It would make his story less believable. He should just erase them or replace them with men. It was the idea that Wright's idea. Um, and, and I've pushed back on this. Like it, Wright said that, by the way, in a book, and then he had a footnote that was with a bunch of references that was supposed to back him up. And I actually went and checked all those references and they don't back him up. Uh, and so that, that's what started all of this. Uh, and then I went and like looked at uh, all the literature, um, scholarship and so on on this and found that the story is the other way around. Now, women weren't, uh, their judgment wasn't trusted. There was a lot of sexism, obviously. Uh, the assumption that women couldn't like handle difficult intellectual things was definitely a thing uh, and that they lacked professional skill at this stuff and so on. But that women could uh, honestly testify to what they saw some simple thing like, uh, the, there was no body in the tomb, uh, that's what I saw. Um, there's no evidence that people would distrust them because they were a woman. If they would distrust them at all, it would be because the story is ridiculous and they were, therefore they wouldn't have trusted even a man having said it, right? So it's, it's not connected to gender when it came to whether someone could reliably testify the things that they saw, especially a very simple fact like that. But if it was something that required technical skill, like whether there's a new moon, because a new, like that's actually a difficult astronomical question. Um, there's actually in the Talmud, like we don't trust women's testimony regarding whether the new moon has begun because that's a technical issue. Uh, and we don't trust women to have technical skills, um, which is stupid, but that's what they said. Uh, but that's different, right? That's different than just saying, well, I saw the moon was dark. It's like, well, that doesn't necessarily mean the new moon started just then, right? So it's like a difference between judgment and testimony. Uh, and, and that I think, right, kind of like, plays an equivocation fallacy between those two. I think a lot of his argument is, is teetering on that particular distinction. Gotcha. And thanks for your question from Coffee Zealot asked, for Richard, do you think that the Vatican has the key or the, in parentheses, hidden documents and books to know the truth of the origins of Christianity? I, I doubt it. No, I, I don't think so. I, I, I'm... I think if there was anything like that, they would have burned it long ago. <laughs> like it wouldn't still be there, right? Uh, if if even. So no, I, I I doubt it. I'm sure there's tons of really scandalous things that they have records of uh, that they're keeping their archives that no one can look at. But they would be things from later history, not not the origins of Christianity. I, I doubt they have anything that we don't know about that would pertain to the ancient world. Gotcha. <laughs> Even though they sort of claim uh, the Roman Catholic Church a, a secret knowledge uh, that it appears to be more Gnostic in ideology than actual uh, foundation for empirical documentation that they may have. So I, I think that's where uh, the Roman um, Catholic Church, and obviously I, could, I view that from an Anglican perspective in our history, but I think it's more of a Gnostic ideology uh, or infused, uh, you know, it, it's more 
mental than any actual documentation. Yeah, and it's most of the documentation is later too. So like it evolved over time and so on. It's kind of like the Freemasons, kind of the Freemasons have their kind of like secret doctrine that they pass on within the club. Uh, the, the Vatican has something like that too, but most of it was composed or invented late, late middle ages or Renaissance and later. So uh, it, it's not useful for reconstructing ancient history. Gotcha. Super interesting. And I, that just made me think of a question. What, just because it's related, I have to ask, I <laughs> absolutely have to get your guys' opinion, both of you, is so in Rome, outside of the Vatican, allegedly underneath one of the churches, I can't remember, I think it's the St. Peter Basilica outside of the Vatican is the name of it. And allegedly Paul is buried underneath and there's an opening where you can see a... I guess I'm not sure what the word for it would be coffin. You can see like just the, the end of it. And it would be a sarcophagus, but yeah. So, thanks. And, and you can see just the end of it. And I'm wondering if you have like a probability assessment of like how convinced <laughs> you would be that that really is the resting place of Paul. Yeah. Almost not. Almost certainly not. I mean, I, I've researched the subject massively and I, I've not seen any literature on that. So um, I would have to check. Because uh, I, I don't, I know there's a lot of like these these sort of made up pilgrimage claims uh, all over the world, uh, and so I'd have to check. But I think if we actually had access to the tomb of Paul, that would be all over the literature uh, in in the field, and it's just not. So uh, clearly, no one really believes that that's actually legit. That makes sense. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jonathan. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, relics as an industry uh, in, the, yeah. in, in the Roman Catholic Church uh, kind of fueled what we see in uh, St. Peter's today. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, indulgences yeah. itself on their uh, teachings were bringing about mass wealth. Uh, and as a result, you know, you have to pay Michelangelo uh, for that work. So. And we see that in the relic tradition uh, that they do. Uh, you have stories of uh, St. Mark's body being uh, smuggled out, uh, you know, and covered under pigs. And supposedly it's in, uh, you know, Venice today in their church. Uh, there's all these secret catacombs. Uh, but it's really spanned after the kind of... Uh, uh, you know, the, the Roman Catholic Church went through this interesting history of getting, uh, during the Crusades, a lot of this really comes up to get people interested in defending the Holy Land. Uh, so uh, I don't know your thoughts on that, Dr. Carey, if you ever explored that part of history. Um, yeah, no, not generally, because none of it can be tied to earlier than the fourth century. Um, and so a lot of that is clearly propagandization. Um, so I and, and the, since it can't be linked to any evidence that ties earlier in the fourth century, it's generally off my radar, if not a thing that I'm so interested in, particularly. Uh, so yeah, I haven't extensively researched that stuff. I know some of the, the pilgrimage um, uh, political stuff that was invented in the fourth century. And I know a little bit about that. But after that, I, I don't look up this stuff anymore because there's tons of it i mean even the ethiopian church claims to have the ark of covenant right so <laughs> and in india claims to have the grave of jesus uh there's there's a grave you can go to they say this is the tomb this is the actual tomb of jesus he, he actually went to india and died here that's uh <laughs> that's the thing uh so yeah i think even odessa claims to have the uh i know you see these talks about it a little bit on uh the the writing to uh uh, the king of Odessa, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Letter to Abgar. Jesus wrote a letter to Abgar. A lot of people don't know that. No, it's actually not true. He almost certainly did not. But <laughs> but Eusebius believed he did, and he had the letter. So it's an example of how Christians were making stuff up. I think quite a lot by then. Oh, super interesting. And thanks for your question from humbly questioning. They asked for Mr. Sheffield. <laughs> Could he confirm that his position is that the Romans' inability to counter the resurrection narrative is proof that Christianity is true? Or I think they're asking, if you wouldn't say it's proof, would you say it's a, a significant evidence or a moderate or even light kind of evidence? Well, in, in, in science, we don't have proof. We just have probability. So we're dealing with the weight of the evidence. And I, I kind of view it in the retrospect of, you know, the state government has all the power. It can subpoena the witnesses. 
Uh, and what we don't have is an indictment or counter narrative against Christianity. Uh, it's everything that I discussed in my debate with Dr. Carrier, uh, convincible proof? No. Uh, is it consistent? Uh, you know, from my perspective, I would say yes. When uh, we look at patterns uh, in the empirical data, uh, a lot of it, from what I see, it's, it swings one way. Um, so from my standpoint, it would be consistent with the idea that the empire was unable to produce uh, a counter narrative to the claims of Christianity. And, you know, if we, we look at the history in the sense of Rome did convert, uh, you know, it, it was converting all over the empire. Uh, so, you know, from my standpoint, they found the gospel truth. Gotcha. Thanks. And humbly questioning asked another question. I love that they had clicked on the link for your guys' written debate. They asked, so they said, Mr. Sheffield says, quote, normal court of law in his blog post. Could he give, is, I'm assuming, is that in the, what you guys have talked about, or is that maybe a different post? Um, I, maybe a paraphrase. I'm not sure. Okay. They said, could he give an example in the last 30 years of a trial where a supernatural claim was mm -hmm. successfully defended? Well, well, I, you know, I, I think we got to make a di uh, distinction between, uh, you know, the constitutional framework that uh, the United States is uh, governed by. When we look at the Supreme Court, um, you, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, the Supreme Court against uh, uh, the religious church of the Indians, uh, where, uh, you know, the state of Arizona brought up they're sort of smoking laws, um, you know, the, the United States course is based on uh, uh, the constitution. So that's how they're governing. So when they made the decision that the state of Arizona was violating uh, the Indians right to use, uh, I think, uh, Petote, uh, part of their religious ceremonies and when Arizona hey, said to, yeah, Peyote, yeah. you know, it, um, because they felt, the Supreme Court, that it infringed on their constitutional right as a church of the Native American people, they ruled on that, not the divine nature of the peyote plant in itself. Now, if they did, it's pretty remarkable uh, that uh, they ruled that the peyote plant was divine because they ruled in favor of their religious practice. But that is... The Roman uh, Empire uh, did not have such constitutional uh, constraint, it, um, and I don't know if Dr. Carrier would agree with me, but I, yeah. I view it more as a police state uh, where they, they kind of have uh, more power uh, than our constitutional government in terms yeah, of they, investigations. They had a similar thing. <clears throat> um, no, it's a good point, and you're right, generally. Uh, they, they had a similar thing. So in... Uh, English common law, or I should guess American common law, because it's originated in the Pennsylvania colonial court before the Constitution. Um, it just became common law that you cannot admit spectral evidence to court. It's not accepted. Uh, spectral evidence meaning visions and uh, things that aren't considered um, uh, religious sources of knowledge rather than secular sources of knowledge. Uh, so you couldn't go in and say, well, I had a dream that he committed the murder and you can't present that as evidence, right? Uh, or God told me. Uh, like that's not admissible as evidence. Um, and the Romans had something similar. You, it was not admissible in court if it was uh, like had visions like that's not pertinent evidence in this court. Like we can't do anything with that. Um, it, I don't think we have it, the doctrine specifically spelled out, but you, there we have tons of uh, court cases and case studies from the Roman Empire, and we can tell that it, it, that's never allowed. Um, and they even had uh, <laughs> like there's there's one case it's not directly re relevant, but it's it's reflects the mindset of the rationalist mindset of Roman legal system uh, is when the Roman emperors passed laws that gave benefits to doctors. So they basically got a subsidy, like you claim a subsidy uh, from the state to be a doctor. And the idea is that you would, you would help the poor or provide some services locally um, uh, at a discount. Uh, and so the state would subsidize you and keep you in place. So there'd be a doctor in town was the whole idea. And uh, uh, hucksters like quacks and, and religious healers tried to get in on this. Uh, and, and the court rules, and this became a standard thing in legal textbooks for the ancient Romans, 
is like, uh, no, <laughs> no, scientific med it's either scientific medicine or that you have to be a legitimate doctor with legitimate training. Uh, you can't come in and claim that you can heal people miraculously. That does not qualify for the subsidy. We don't accept that. Uh, and so that gives you the sort of rationalist mindset that they had. Like they, if you couldn't give them concrete evidence, uh, they didn't accept it otherwise. And they, they weren't interested in it otherwise. Um, but the other side is true too. Uh, we have the constitutional reason where the courts are actually forbidden to rule on religious uh, disputes. Um, they can dispute, they can rule on factual disputes that can be independently assessed with, with secular evidence, uh, but they can't, say, they can't rule on whether a religious claim is true or false by itself. It's not, it's prohibited. The Romans technically could do that. They just didn't care, <laughs> right? So that's the difference between, so the Romans were definitely tyrannical and, would, and there was lots of court abuses and sort of like uh, definitely an oppressive police state in a sense. Um, but they, their oppression was uh, on behavior, not belief. They just didn't really care about belief. And that changed once the Christians took over and then you have the Middle Ages and then it's all about belief. Uh, and then they're very tightly linking belief to behavior. Like, so you have to suppress belief to prevent the behaviors that it causes. That's a doctrine that, that was really invented by the Christians. It wasn't, a Ro the Romans didn't think of it that way. It was just like, can't you just be behave? Let's please just behave. We don't care about what you believe. Just can you just behave? Uh, and, and behave meant, you know, follow our rules, was, right? So it's not necessarily enlightened uh, rules. But nonetheless, that was the, that was the difference. So, so there, there's parallels and, and differences there. But um, the questioner's question is, has a supernatural claim ever been defended in court and succeeded? And we really can't, I mean, the answer is no, but we can't infer too much from that because modern courts are prohibited from doing that usually. Um, it would have to be like their fraud cases, for instance, where someone is doing a miracle act and defraud someone. And then there's a factual question as to whether they were engaging in fraud. Um, that the courts can deal with, but you have to, that's a very narrow subject. You'd have to specifically be going after them for fraud. Uh, and then there has to be the elements of the crime have to be there. You can't just be going around claiming you can heal people. That in itself is not fraud. Uh, at least not, it's not recognized as such by the courts. So, so it's difficult to find an example that would be relevant to, the, I think, the argument the questioner wants to make. A better analogy would be the Randy Prize. Uh, it was a million dollars offered for proof of the supernatural for 50 years. Uh, if it could survive any, science, you know, any legitimate scientific test, and no one claimed the prize in 50 years. That's much more relevant uh, to uh, the point I think the questioner was wanted to make. Gotcha. Saw you smiling, Jonathan. If there's anything you were you were thinking about, no, no, I, no. I think it's good. And, and Dr. Carrier hit it. You know, uh, the Supreme Court, the Constitution prevents uh, ruling on that. That's why in the case on uh, Native American Church, they didn't rule on was the peyote plant divine or not, but uh, they were infrig the state of Arizona was infringing on its right, uh, which they considered uh, their by preventing use of the peyote plant was essentially preventing uh, religious practice by the Native American uh, church. Um, so, no, it was a good point, Dr. Carrier brought up. Gotcha. And thanks, Maya Asburns, for your question, who asked, Dr. Carrier, do you think? Let me know if I mispronounce this. Vespas, uh, Vespasian. Vespasian, thank you. Had anything to do with writing the Gospels? Vespasian. Uh, oh, I, I know what they're talking about. They're talking about the Atwill thesis. Okay. Uh, no, I don't believe that. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, I, 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 if you're really interested, I do have an article on Joseph Atwill uh, on my blog. Um, I think it's a tinfoil hat theory. Uh, the, the idea is that the Christianity was invented as a, as a con to try and pacify the Jews. It was invented by the Romans, by the Roman elite. Uh, and Josephus is a conspiracy. Josephus and Vespasian and Titus were all in on it. Uh, and and it's, it's a ridiculous theory, top to bottom. Um, but if you want to know more about it uh, and why I think it's a ridiculous theory, top to bottom, uh, I have an article uh, on Joseph Atwell on my blog at richardcarrier.info, and you can follow it up there. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I would have to agree with Dr. Carrier on that point. Right? <laughs> and, and, and I think during our debate on the long ending of Mark, uh, that question came up in the comments. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it's common. Um, the Joseph Atwell himself has tons of money, so he can market it uh, like crazy. 
and has it has a large it's had a large following even since longer than him he didn't invent this theory it's it's called the it's it's ironically called the piezo conspiracy theory but there, there was an actual piezo conspiracy theory which was a conspiracy to assassinate nero but but there's this other piezo conspiracy theory that that somehow the piezo family was involved in inventing christianity and it goes back to the i think the 19th century if not earlier so it's been around for all this weird theory has been around for a long time um but joseph atwell kind of put a lot of money behind marketing it and i think that's why it gets a lot of attention now huh. okay cool really interesting and let's see i'm trying to picture like kind of piece together what records that this question might be referring to you guys might be able to i feel like always the speakers are able to they're kind of like the engines are running and and so they usually kind of get it better than i do they said are the records of jesus's time considered unreliable or largely missing uh, that's a vague question um <clears throat> so it, as a general rule uh <clears throat> first century roman era is better documented than any other first century era. So China, for example, or India or Persia, we have way more documentation from ancient Rome. On the other side though, we have almost none of the documentation from ancient Rome from that period. So we have a tiny, tiny fraction of it. So there's a ton more documentation that existed that just hasn't survived. Um, so so that, that question is hard to answer depending on where you're setting the threshold for, as, in terms of a lot or a little. Um, and with regard to like Judea, we have, we honestly do have very little in terms of what's called textual evidence as opposed to like archeological. Textual evidence means people who were in the know writing about it. Um, we don't have a lot. We have Josephus. We have a lot if you count Josephus, but if you take away Josephus, we have very little. Uh, and, and that's a problem because we're relying a lot on one author's biases and limitations and sourcing and things like that. So um, there's been a lot of recent scholarship kind of calling into question the reliability of Josephus. Uh, but it's not like Josephus is, it's not like the gospels, which I think are completely making stuff up. That's my, my opinion. Josephus isn't generally doing that. He might make up a few stories, uh, but generally he's reporting stuff that he can actually source in some fashion or other. Um, and so he's not completely unreliable, but he's not also completely reliable either. Uh, so it's a complex question. Um, there's Michael Grant, I think it was Michael Grant, wrote a book called uh, Ancient Ancient Historians, Information and Disinformation, or Information and Misinformation. I can't remember the exact title. Where his whole book, and he's an ancient historian, his whole book is about this problem, that, that there are no ancient historians that we completely trust, but it's not that we completely distrust them either. It's, it's complicated and difficult and takes work to try to extract historical reliable information from the sources that we have. You bet. Jonathan, if you want anything to add, you can. Otherwise, I'll jump to the next question. Well, you know, obviously, I, I look at the, the first century, uh, you know, the golden age of, you know, some of the greatest historians. You know, obviously, Tacitus has always been, a, you know, a huge favorite of mine, uh, the works of Suetonius. I mean, obviously, the turn of the first, but writing on that particular period, um, you know, we do have historians and, and given we all have our biases. So obviously you're going to see that in their kind of uh, uh, theological makeup or uh, their perspective uh, or their vantage point they're writing on things. But I, I, I think we have a collection of some excellent historians writing at the period. I mean, uh, when we look at, um, I mean, Tacitus and Suetonius and and Pliny, uh, Josephus as well, uh, you know, Philo provides a lot of information that kind of helps us put together what that histographic narrative uh, may have looked like. So they, they provide a lot of information on the period uh, that I, I kind of look at some of the greatest historians probably of all time it really sit around that period writing about the first century. So. Those are really my thoughts. You bet. Thanks so much. And also, thanks for your question. We always love these, these like, these are juicy. This one's a juicy one. Mashi <laughs> M, thanks for your question. Asks, would Dr. Carrier debate Bart Ehrman? I know they have some differences regarding the New Testament. Yeah. Uh, no, I totally would. I, I've long wanted to, um, but he won't. Uh, he's been offered thousands of dollars to debate me and has turned it down. 
Um, and his reasoning is that I'm too rude, I think, is that what he usually, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not, that's not an exact quote, um, but he won't debate me because I'm too rude. I, I think really that's code for, I caught him lying and, and said so, <laughs> I think. Uh, and also I use words like sucks um, rather than some sort of stodgy elitist vocabulary that means the same thing. Uh, so uh, it's, I, I use a, I, I speak in the public vernacular, I think, he doesn't like that. Uh, and, um, and he doesn't, he thinks I'm mean. And so that's, he doesn't want you to debate someone who's mean. Uh, that, that's been his excuse. That's what he said. Uh, but no, yeah, he's turned it down. He's, I think it was the last offer was like five grand he was offered to debate me and, and turned it down. So. Gotcha. Well, maybe someday, Mahashi, um, maybe not soon though. And, uh, thanks for your question from, appreciate it. Brandon Irish, who asked, how do historians prove the Gospels were written so far after the resurrection event? Well, oh, okay. Yeah, Jonathan, you, you can get them up to speed on what the mainstream view is and why. Yeah, so once again, you know, there's been a shift, you know, at least from my perspective, and, it, you know, Dr. Kerry can weigh on, in on this too, over the last 250 years, which I understand coming not only out of the, uh, the Enlightenment period, but out of the German rationalism, uh, the, the Tübingen school, uh, there was an emerging worldview coming out uh, at the end of the 17th and 18th century uh, that really started to focus its critical analysis or studies on understanding uh, the origins and history of the textual formation of the New Testament. Um, I know Bauer did a lot at the Tübingen School. Um, you know, uh, Griesbach uh, had his theories as well. So there's there's an emerging view that came out of uh, the German rationalism of the late 18th century that has shifted thought uh, against a traditional uh, historical uh, perspective of the ancient apostolic churches. So obviously the idea that Mark was first uh, is coming out of that particular school of thought. Uh, and historically, the, the documentation uh, that we have from the ancient churches, those that were uh, closest to the uh, apostles and the churches, you know, have a historical perspective different than uh, this modern school of thought. And I know uh, Dr. Carrier obviously uh, is probably going to lean more towards that view. And uh, now in our discussion on the long ending of Mark, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to take the, the historical uh, traditional view. And so that's really where the swing is. It's on which particular school of thought or worldview uh, do you trust uh, the historicity on? Uh, obviously, Dr. Carey has his view that I'll let me explain. Yeah. Uh, mine comes from, uh, you know, the, the ancient uh, polity of the apostolic churches. So uh, I'll let Dr. Carrier explain this. Yeah, in, in scholarship, the secular scholarship or even liberal Christian scholarship, dominant mainstream view is uh, that everything follows Mark because everything copies Mark or copies something copying Mark. So we know relative dating, Mark is first. Um, there have been some attempts to argue maybe Matthew comes first, but the, the argument, if you look at like the philological arguments, it doesn't really work. I, I wish they did because Matthew coming first would make way more sense in so many ways. Um, but the actual philological evidence really strongly supports Mark, the Mark and priority. And that's been, the, that's become the mainstream view now. And uh, Mark in multiple places, not just chapter 13, but in multiple places, he's writing a kind of response to a sort of apologetic for why the temple was destroyed in the year 70. So we know he's writing after the year 70 and perhaps close enough that that's still an issue that they have to deal with. Um, and close enough that it was still possible to claim that the end of the world could come any time now and still be within uh, what was then believed to be a standard human lifetime or maximum human lifetime. They, they thought the maximum age for a human was 120 years. Um, there probably never was anyone that old. But uh, they thought that that was the, if you were to say, like, what is the longest someone could live, they would have answered 120. And so they, when Jesus said the end was going to come within the lives of those still standing, they had to have the kind of like this wandering Jew theology where there had to be some person 
who is there is still wandering around somewhere and hasn't died yet. And that's the only reason the world hasn't ended. So if you put these kinds of arguments together, you can kind of conjecture pretty reliably that Mark had to have been written after 70, probably before 100. Uh, <clears throat> and, and that's how that's generally the range that it's put in. And then you look at later authors, you have like Luke, uh, Matthew's writing after Mark. And so it's got to be within five to 10, 15 years of Mark. Uh, Luke is writing probably after Matthew, although that's there's different arguments as to how that dating comes out. But Luke, there's a lot of scholars agree that Luke is relying on the antiquities of Josephus for a lot of his constructed material, the stuff he's, he's coloring his story with. Um, and so that puts him after 93. Um, Luke is not mentioned by Papias. And so some scholars think that maybe that puts Luke even later than Papias. So the range is somewhere between 95 and 130 for Luke. Um, some scholars argue around 115. I don't know. But, but generally we say, like, let's go as early as possible. We'll say 90s. Let's say 90s and leave it at that. But that's not like a super secure conclusion. It's just like that's most probably no earlier than the 90s. Beyond that, it's hard to, to really be specific. We get the first time we get any datable reference to the Gospels is Justin Martyr. And we know that's like roughly 50s and 60s or 150s and 160s. And he's referencing what we know as the gospel, the Protevangelion of James, because he talks about Jesus being born in a cave, which is a later gospel that's not in the New Testament, um, but it's based on the gospel of Luke. So we know that, that the gospel of Luke predates Justin because he's citing this other book that uses the gospel. Of Luke. So it's like all these really complicated strings of inference that get us these sort of ranges of dates. So we know it had, the gospels were probably all written before 150 and after 70, and after that, it's, it's kind of wishy-washy. We can't really be certain because none of them actually say when they were written. Um, so unlike a lot of other books, by the way, it's actually kind of unusual to not have some sort of datable reference in the book. Not not completely unusual, but it was there was often like Josephus talks about when he's writing, like what, what date he's publishing on and stuff like that. So, um, so, but no, we don't have like that kind of information. We just have this sort of, we have to sort of in, infer based on internal and external evidence what the most likely ranges of dates are. And that's the mainstream view. Um, I side with it generally. Um, I allow for the earliest possible dates because I like to argue a fortiori, which means argue from the stronger arguments. I like give historicists the best case possible, which is the earliest dates possible, and then see what conclusion follows. But I also, I do suspect the gospels might've been written a little later than a lot of scholars think. Um, so I allow the range to be that, you know, 70 to 150. Um, and then I think uh, we know, or 140, actually, I should say 140, because Marcion came out with his canon in, in 140, we think, according to other sources. We don't actually know this from Marcion himself. Uh, and it's clear that he, that Luke existed then, which means Mark must have existed then, probably Matthew. So, um, so we know that Gospels had to have been written by 140, possibly even John, we're not sure, but certainly by then. And then the Gospels we have were assembled in a canon that was designed to combat Martian's canon. So it's actually the second canon. The first canon doesn't survive. We don't actually have it. Uh, so it's like a, there was an was original Bible. It was Martian's. And then there was like the anti-Martianite Bible. It's the Bible we have today. Um, so anyways, a complex, a lot of issues here. Um, we, John and I touched into some of this in our last debate. Uh, if you go back, and that's a much longer debate. It had many entries written uh, on and each it's 1100 word entry uh, me him me him me him it kind of goes back and forth like that on the long ending of mark and you can find that on my blog and you can go through it and it touches on a lot of scholarship the, the footnotes and things and so if you really want to look at that uh, that's one place to go and another one I suggest is my article um, three things to know about the New Testament or the New Testament manuscripts I think I say but um, so on my blog you can just look for three things New Testament and you'll find it and I just go through three things you should know about the New Testament. And one of those things relates to this, what we're talking about here. Gotcha. Thanks so much, both of you. And last question, we won't, have to, we won't ask you to uh, give a defense of whether it be yes or no. But the <laughs> top tier scholarship, thanks for your uh, question. The only reason I say that is just because we, we're getting close to being out of time. We're basically at that sure. limit. And they said, is the Trinity a pagan Roman concept? And then they shouted, ultra test. Ultra test? I don't know if it, I, I think it's ultra testosterone abbreviation. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm confused. Sure. Oh, oh, that's like a reference. It's a joke as with commercials. But anyway, yeah. Um, no, Jonathan, what's your take on that? I'm curious. 
Well, it, it, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, throughout the historical writings, um, and we can see this very early on, uh, it's, it, especially in Tertullian against uh, Praxius, uh, it, it, it appears that uh, Tertullian is actually responding against a very early uh, Sibelius type uh, uh, kind of Unitarian uh, type view of the Trinity uh, where, you know, there is no Trinity. Uh, and Tertullian is giving some sort of perspective on that, that we're able to see some reference to the Tertullian, uh, to the Trinity in his works. Uh, we know Novation um, spent some time on this issue. Uh, and obviously, uh, this was an issue, especially with Rome, because uh, Sibelius was a friend of the Pope. Uh, so kind of think that he was in on it as well. Uh, but, you know... <laughs> The, the major issue really doesn't uh, come up. And, and, and for me, uh, the, the Trinity, uh, the, the discussion with Arius being excommunicated or thrown out of the Church of Alexandria by his Bishop Alexandria, it's really what sparked uh, the discussion at uh, Nicaea uh, on that particular issue. Now, um, I, I look at the Arians as particularly believing in the Trinity but uh, they understood a time when God did not exist or Christ did not exist, which would make them uh, another God. So essentially you're creating three gods. Uh, Sibelius understood you kind of uh, manifestations of God, but it's only one. Um, I think the issue in the East, and I'd like to hear Dr. Carrier's opinion on this too, was a little different than what happened at the Council of Carthage in 484 uh, by the Vandal King mm -hmm. when the North African church was responding. I, I think the issue in the West and the East were a little different, uh, and, and we see different uh, responses coming out of the church. Uh, obviously, I know that there's large groups that, you know, maybe hold to a theological evolutionary development of it, but I'd like to hear Dr. Carrier's thoughts on that as well. Yeah, to get to the, I'll start with the questioners. I think what they're getting at is, does the concept come from paganism? And I, I think there might be a confusion as to what Trinitarianism means. Um, so uh, there were lots of trinities in the sense of threes. So like the Capitoline Triad was like the foundation of the Roman Empire was the three gods who were the, the core gods of Rome, which was Juno, uh, Juno, Jupiter, and Mars, uh, and Quirinus, but uh, no, it's Quirinus, uh, but um, which is Romulus. But anyway, so there, there's this Capitoline triad was kind of like the core three, and there's lots of like Egypt has this these concepts. This is not what Christianity means by the Trinity. Ironically, they mean the opposite of that, which is unity. Uh, they mean there's three things in one; that it's all one and the same thing. They're not three different things, um, and so that's a very specific doctrine. Now. The idea that many things could be one thing, not specifically three, but many things could be one thing, is pagan. That, that predates Christianity. It was actually the henotheistic trend that we see all throughout Hellenistic religion. Uh, you see it already in, in Herodotus, but you start to see it in later, this idea that, oh, Osiris, that's just Bacchus. Like, they're the same god. And so that instead of those being two separate gods, they're just instantiations or versions of the same god. And people started, like, stacking gods up into one god. Uh, right, and so the, everything is one God, but just different visages of that God. Right, that concept of doing that was was definitely pagan. It was a, a huge trend that was going up, leading up into the Roman Empire. And by the time of the Roman Empire, everybody was doing it. Everybody would under, understood it. Um, and but that's not specifically Trinitarianism. Actually, Trinitarianism is kind of a weird doctrine that's born more out of, in my opinion, politics than than theology or culture. Um, the best account I ever read about this was Bart Ehrman. Uh, he wrote the book, How Jesus Became God. And in like the last chapter or two, he quickly goes over the Council of Nicaea and what happened there and how the Nicene Creed specifically came to be created. And he shows very well, like very elegantly and quickly, that it was politics. It wasn't really like they're basically creating this illogical doctrine for political reasons in order to have a, a sort of litmus test to include and exclude the people they wanted to include and exclude. And so they were taking all these different church ideas and combining them into one, thus declaring that these churches we accept and the ones who don't drink this Kool-Aid we don't accept. 
basically, is that that's what happened. So it's kind of like a really bizarre, unique event in history that doesn't really have precedence. It's just a weird thing that happened for political reasons in that particular historical circumstance. And that's the Trini that's what Trinitarianism means when Christians will say, and like some will do, that, that a Christian who doesn't believe in the Trinity isn't a real Christian. So Jehovah's Witnesses aren't real Christians. Mormons aren't real Christians, etc. Um, this obsession over that concept of Trinitarianism, that's Nicene. That, that's actually an invention of the Nicene Council. And, and it's probably unique in history. It's just a weird doctrine. If you go back like to the origins of Christianity, you look at Paul, for example. Paul understood there, yes, there was, there was God, there was Jesus, and there was the Holy Spirit. There, these three entities existed, but he didn't see them as identical. Like, Jesus is a created angel. He's actually a subordinate to God, and they sh he, God bestows certain powers onto Jesus, and, and they, they can kind of, like, there's a certain overlap of who they are, but they're not identical. And the Holy Spirit is kind of like the body through which God interacts with the world. So it's they're not identical, but they're also not separate, right? You know what I mean? So that was there. Then you get to John, and you have finally the merger of Jesus and God, where they're saying, well, well they're the one and the same. They've always been since the beginning of time. There's actually precedence in Judaism for that. This idea, we see it in Philo. Philo talks about the fundamental original man, pre-Adam, pre not, not Adam, but it was like this, the fundamental, and he is described as an archangel of many names. It's the creator of the universe is this archangel. But Philo talks about it as if it was kind of an emanation of God, and therefore, in a sense, identical with God. It's kind of like a part of God, uh, is the way Philo would probably describe it. It's like one of the components of God. Uh, and, and in a sense, also maybe a body through which God acts, right? So um, so it's kind of Trinitarian, but there, the Holy Spirit hasn't been folded in yet. So like John isn't, John is writing something that fits within Jewish theology, but it's still not the Trinitarianism of the Nicene Creed. Uh, and, and you see it evolve over time. And, and the course it takes is more based on politics and historical happenstance. It's not, they're not just borrowing ideas from the pagans on this, in this case. Um, the, the pagan ideas were very different. Um, there are certain similarities uh, and overlap, but they, they weren't, it wasn't like that with the concept of Trinitarianism that we're talking about here. Um, that's my view on it. That's, that's my take on the Trinity. You bet. Thank you both. And also want to say thank you to so many people. Thanks for the mods out there. Appreciate you. All of your help. It means it means a lot. You have no idea. And want to say thanks for hanging out with us. Just watching tonight, folks. Hope you enjoyed it. And as I had mentioned before, if you don't know about it, I have put the links of both of these speakers down in the description. And right below their personal links, I have put the link to where you can hear, or I should say read, as they're, you could say, prequel or kind of the beginning of this debate has started in written form and so you can go there right now and read more so want to say thanks so much dr carrier and jonathan it's been a true pleasure to have you and yeah thank you question, uh, dr carrier do, do you still want people to come out to your blog and write comments because sure they, yeah any, yeah on, on our debates like because that's the rule you want is anybody who has a polite relevant comment posts that's not nor normally there. I'm more restricted as to who can comment on my stuff, but for our debates, yes, it's open commenting as long as just people just be polite and relevant. That's all I ask. <laughs> you bet. Absolutely. So we highly encourage you to do just that at those links below folks and want to say one last time, thanks so much to our speakers. And with that folks keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Take care and have a great weekend.